Very good, excellent. Good afternoon, everybody. I call to order today's regular council meeting of the Township of Cavan Monaghan on this Monday, March 15th. I'd ask for, there is one addition to today's agenda. Um, and that addition is an item under general business, item 12.1, Peterborough Public Health Vaccine Clinics. So unless there's any other additions, I would ask for a uh, motion to, for the modified agenda, moved by Deputy Mayor Graham, seconded by Councillor Huntley. Uh, Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Mayor McFadden? Yes. Councillor Huntley? Yes. Councillor Belch? Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham? Yes. And Councillor Moore? Yes. Motion is approved. I'd ask that any members declare any pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof at this time or when the situation arises. Seeing just none, be just oh, be oh. aware of the Ides of March. Seeing today. none, <laughs> there is no closed session. I will um, then be moving along to item number six, public meeting. Item 6.1, I need a resolution to open the public meeting. Moved by Deputy Mayor Graham, seconded by Councillor Huntley. <laughs> Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Councillor Moore. Yes. Councillor Belch. Yes. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Mayor McFadden. Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Motion is approved. We're now opened our public meeting, so we will move into item 6.2, report planning 2021-04, 918 Highway 7A, um, zoning bylaw amendment. Ms. Ellis? Thank you, Mayor McFadden, members of council. Today's public meeting is to hear comments from members of the public about a proposed zoning bylaw amendment for an existing lot of record located at 918 Highway 7A in the Cabin Hamlet. The property is located in part of lot 12, concession nine of the cabin ward, and it's approximately 275 square meters or 0.679 acres in size and has about 13.97 meters or 45.83 feet of frontage. This existing lot of record is currently developed with one um, building that is was developed as a garage and now the proponent has applied for a rezoning to allow the property to be used as a single detached dwelling. The existing building is about 85.8 square meters in size, which is just over 900 square feet. And there's an attached covered porch at the rear of the building, which adds another 19.2 square meters or just over 200 square feet. The property is currently serviced with a private well and a holding tank. The property is currently zoned a commercial zone. And so a residential use of the property is not permitted. So Kevin Duguay on behalf of the owner who is Patrick Devlin has applied to the township for the rezoning of the subject property. As proposed, the zoning bylaw amendment will change the zoning on the property from the highway commercial exception zone to the Hamlet residential exception 17 zone. In the Hamlet residential exception 17 zone, the permitted uses will be limited to a single detached dwelling. The minimum lot area requirement will be 270 square meters. The minimum lot frontage requirement will be 13.97 meters. The minimum front yard will be zero meters. The minimum interior side yard on the east side will be 2.04 meters. The minimum interior side yard on the west side will be 4.37 meters. The maximum lot coverage will be 55% and the minimum number of parking spaces required will be one parking space. And that parking space will be 2.5 meters by six meters in size. In addition, the bylaw will recognize that the existing building projects beyond the lot lines by 0 0.67 meters. So uh, following that, uh, as per standard practice and under the requirements of the Planning Act, this zoning bylaw amendment application was circulated to all assessed persons within 120 meters of the subject property, to all required ministries and agencies, and to all internal staff members. With the uh, agency and public circulation, we did hear, or we did have inquiries from two members of the public who were interested in the residential use. We also did receive written comments from a neighbor 
who expressed concerns in writing about snow storage, the location of the building and safety factor, given that the front door opens right onto the sidewalk and the proximity to the highway. They expressed concerns about parking and about servicing, particularly with the location of the well and the servicing of the holding tank. Peterborough Public Health also confirmed to the township that they, the holding tank as it exists today is not large enough, so it requires a change of use permit and the applicant must file an application with public health and they will assess that application in terms of applicable law, which includes the zoning bylaw amendment, Ontario building code, et cetera. In terms of internal staff comments, we heard from the public works comment that they have an issue with the location of the existing building. They suggest that the building encroachment be legalized with the MTO or that the building be moved. And at this time, they do not support the rezoning. Notice of the application does satisfy the requirements of the Planning Act. Um, the application was also assessed in terms of the Township's official plan, Peterborough County official plan, the growth plan, and the provincial policy statement. And comments about those planning documents are outlined in the report attached uh, to the agenda. So at this point in time, we are looking for comments from members of the public about the proposed rezoning. And then we will come back to Council at a later date with a recommendation about this application. Having said that, the recommendations in the planning report today are that Council review and consider all verbal and written comments received at the public meeting. And secondly, that a draft bylaw be presented to Council at a future date for consideration. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. Is there any questions or comments from uh, members of council? I'm just going to give it a little bit extra time just to make sure that uh, all the councillors have an opportunity. Some are raising their hands, so I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity. Seeing none, then I will move then on to 6.4, which is questions, comments from members of the public. So I know we do have a gallery. Um, of participants and bear with me. So I see several um, in the gallery already um, as attendees and I have Jerry Burns who's just raised his hand. Go ahead, Jerry. I believe uh, Ms. Page will have to let you in and then you can uh, proceed. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Burns. Uh, your microphone is muted. You're just going to have to unmute your microphone there. Um, Mr. Burns, if you can, once you're unmuted, just uh, identify yourself and your address for the public record. There you go. You were unmuted. Um, so proceed just with your name, address for the clerk, and then proceed. Jerry, 957 Stewart Line, Cabin, Ontario. If I get this right, there's zero frontage. You're right on the edge of the sidewalk and then the property actually protrudes over another lot line. I'm guessing that's the porch at the back. I don't know. Um, my big concern is that you're going to allow a children's bedroom to be within 10 feet of a, a busy highway. So busy. In fact, it's up for review right now for a uh, rework. Um, I just, trying to grasp how you're handling this as far as a residential property within the framework of your official plan. Through you, Mayor McFadden, to Mr. Burns, the official plan designation on the property right now is Hamlet. So in the Hamlet designation, a variety of land uses are permitted. A single detached residential use is a permitted use within the Hamlet designation. You, um, there is a projection of the existing building beyond the front lot line. So the building itself actually projects onto the Highway 7A right of way. So the bylaw as drafted will permit a slight projection of the existing building. So that projection as indicated in the bylaw is 0 0.67 meters. Mr. Burns, did that answer your question? other than the idea of having a children's bedroom less than 10 feet from a highway's edge. 
Okay. Uh, I'm looking, now we have uh, Mr. Duguay. You'll have to be let in. And there you are, Mr. Duque. Now we just need to remove your mute. Mayor McFadden, members of council, I trust you can hear me now, yes? We can hear yeah. you. Thank you very much. Um, I will um, advise council uh, that uh, I have been working with uh, planning staff um, uh, regarding the preparation and advancement of uh, the uh, uh, staff report 2020-104 regarding rezoning of the subject property. I visited a property on more than one occasion. I've also had opportunity to uh, follow the MTO uh, corridor planning uh, project and, and I've talked directly with the MTO staff. We have considered the many design alternatives contemplated for this um, um, intersection some of which would not be impactful on this property in any way. Some would be. This property is small. There's no, I mean, I, I, that's why the uh, bylaw as pr presented um, includes a, um, a series of exceptions to the stand, standard Hamlet residential zone. The property, uh, in fact, if you consider its zoning for commercial land uses and consider the size of the property, um, from my perspective as a, as a professional planner, um, real, it was questionable whether or not that property could even sustain a commercial use. Whereas uh, the, the marketplace has looked at this, so has my client, that this has a potential as a small two bedroom residential dwelling in a designated Hamlet area. Um, we acknowledge that there may be a need for an encroachment agreement. If that's uh, the uh, wish of the municipality, that can be done. That's not uncommon. In fact, uh, my review of several of the properties at this intersection, many are very close or if not also within the road allowance. That's just how these properties were developed um, in, in the past. Um, we, I've also considered the comments from um, uh, DOMA uh, from 912 Highway 7A with respect to snow removal, uh, et cetera. Um, if this property is used, regardless of how it's used, snow removal will have to occur to provide access to the driveway. It could be simply moved to, uh, suppose the snow could go to the back of the property. There is a gated access to, from the driveway to the rear of the property, which incidentally also provides another way into this dwelling. It's not just the front door. There is another way into this dwelling. So I've considered the staff report as presented. Um, I also, uh, the comments from Public Works, uh, this is not a building where we can simply move the building or, or and I don't think it's uh, economically feasible um, uh, to uh, relocate or reconfigure the building. We also have had some comments um, from the property owner with respect to the adequacy of the holding tank. And it, uh, it's my understanding that the holding tank, a tank as existing is adequate for a two bedroom dwelling. But if necessary, we can confirm that through the permit process with the health unit and the municipality. Your Worship, I am available to respond to um, any queries of uh, uh, council regarding the application. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Mr. Dugate. Uh, just a question, the homeowners identifying that the holding tank is sufficient for two bedrooms, but it could be confirmed through the health unit. So how, how did the homeowner confirm that it would be adequate? The homeowner retained, uh, and I have some correspondence from a company locally that uh, deals with holding tanks, cleanings, et cetera. And it was their opinion. We've located the tank and it was their understanding that uh, the tank that was in place, and I don't profess to be an expert in this regard, but I do rely upon um, opinion and from um, the industry. And it was the, their, their opinion and through their discussion with the health unit that what was there would be adequate it may still require final confirmation and sign off from the health unit. So this person that provided the opinion has something in writing from the health unit then? I, I don't know if we, I have not received something in final, no, but we do have a sketch showing its adequacy, showing, or excuse me, its location, its volume, 
um, on the property. It was their opinion based upon other similar properties that the tank that is there is appropriate for a two small two bedroom apartment with one kitchen and one toilet, one bathroom. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. Is there any other um, questions? I am looking to the attendees. We have several that are here. If you wish, just raise your hand. We will let you in to ask your question. I'll give it a little bit extra in case anybody is having issues with their technology. There is, um, there's about 10, 15 that are attendees currently. Okay, seeing no further hands then, um, I would look to uh, council then for consideration of the report. Councillor Huntley. Through you, Chair, I move we re receive the report as. Receive the report and accept the recommendation. Exactly. Well stated, seconded by Deputy Mayor Graham. Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Councillor Moore. Yes. Councillor Belch. Yes. And Mayor McFadden. Yes, motion is approved. Can I get a resolution resolution then to close the public meeting? Deputy Mayor Graham and Councillor Moore. Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Councillor Belch. Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Mayor McFadden. Yes. Councillor Moore. Yes. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Very good. Motion is approved. Uh, next item then is number seven, presentations. Um, item 7.1, Lisa Darling, Inspector Detachment Commander and Linda Davis, Contract Analyst of the OPP proposal. Welcome Lisa and Linda. Give us one moment while we put you into the gallery. Okay, Lisa is here and Linda is here. So we are ready for the presentation. Both of you currently have your mute on still. And Lisa's unmuted. Go ahead, Lisa. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Linda is going to start the presentation today. I think she's just trying to get set up there. Yeah, I'm just. Uh... Oh, very good. Excellent. Before we get started, I'm just going to get a motion from council for the additional information that was uh, provided. Um, very good. Uh, Deputy Mayor Graham, seconded by. Councillor Moore, Madam Clerk, recorded vote for the additional materials. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Mayor McFadden. Yes. Councillor Moore. Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. And Councillor Belch. Yes. Motion is approved. All right, uh, Ms. Davis, proceed. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Your Worship, members of council, Ms. Hurley and staff, and ladies and gentlemen watching virtually. My name is Linda Davis, and I'm an analyst with the Municipal Policing Bureau of the OPP. It's my pleasure to be here today to present to you the OPP costing proposal for policing services for the Township of Cabin Monaghan. Also joining online is Inspector Lisa Darling, who's the commander of the Peterborough County Detachment, who will be assisting with this presentation. Inspector Leah Gilfoy, who's representing Central Region and responsible for staff development and training. My coworker and backup, Sergeant Kelly Withrow, and our manager, Acting Staff Sergeant Ken Key. This costing was requested by your council through a letter sent to the Ministry of the Solicitor General and the minister directed us to provide it. Therefore, my purpose here is to provide you with information about policing services provided by the OPP and the estimated cost of those services. My objective today is to ensure that you have a full understanding of the OPP's proposal, 
um, in order to assist you in making an informed decision for your community's future policing needs. In addition to the presentation, you've been provided with electronic copies of the contract proposal, the 2019 OPP annual report, and the current OPP strategic plan. This afternoon, we'll, we'll address the following areas. OPP reporting and accountability, the transition contract, the cost of policing Cavan Monaghan, services delivered by the Peterborough County OPP detachment, including regional and provincial support. At the end, we can answer questions for clarification in relation to this presentation. We expect that you will want to review it more closely, which may generate more questions, and we'll be pleased to respond at a later date to any additional questions that you may have. Bear with me here. Uh, next slide, please. Here you have an organizational chart of our command structure showing our commissioner, Thomas Carreek, along with our deputy commissioners and provincial commander. Mary Silverthorne is provincial commander responsible for corporate services. Rose DeMarco is deputy commissioner responsible for traffic safety and operational support. Chuck Cox is deputy commissioner of investigations and organized crime. Chris Harkins is the Deputy Commissioner of Field Operations. The OPP is a provincial police service and our commissioner reports to the Solicitor General, Sylvia Jones. Next slide, please. Thank you. The OPP was formed in 1909 and has a long history of municipal policing in Ontario. We've been policing municipalities under contract since the 1940s. We currently police 327 of 444 municipalities in Ontario on a cost recovery basis. As of March 1st of this year, we have currently 117 contracts serving 148 municipalities and 179 municipalities receiving policing services from the OPP under a Section 5.1 Police Services Act non-contract agreement. The OPP cost recovery process is mandated and geared to achieving fair cost recovery from municipalities. With over 8,900 members assigned to work locations across Ontario, we have vast experience in both provincial and municipal policing throughout the province. Next slide, please. Our most recent annual report of which an electronic copy was provided to you gives you a snapshot of the OPP in 2019. This report provides an extensive overview of the services we deliver under both of our provincial and municipal mandates. The report includes a segment on OPP municipal policing costs and resources which may be of particular interest to you on pages 16 and 17. However, I will note that there is a slight error on page 17, the resources page. The two columns that you see on that page for municipal policing recoveries and specialized services costs are pointing to the wrong sides of the circle diagram. It currently looks like we recover 64% of our costs through municipal policing when actually that's the provincial side of policing and 30, approximately 34% is covered um, is recovered by municipal policing. The scope of our responsibility includes traffic safety and community policing, combating organized crime and technically complex crime, emergency response and crime prevention. While these are all day-to-day -day activities, they are not static. We remain committed to delivering policing services that are intelligence led and applying analytics in the deployment of resources to target public safety trends. Next slide, please. Ontario Regulation 399 of the Police Services Act sets out the requirements for adequate and effective policing services. 
adequacy and effectiveness of the OPP is monitored, bo is monitored both internally by our quality assurance unit, as well as externally by the provincial auditor who conducts audits at regular intervals with follow-ups to monitor any items requiring corrective action. Next slide, please. The OPP uses an integrated service delivery model supporting both provincial and municipal responsibilities from our detachments. On this slide are listed some of the advantages and benefits to using this model, including the sharing of administration, supervisory and other resources, enhanced flexibility in meeting fluctuating demand at a lower cost, and coordinated policing strategies for multi-jurisdictional issues. At this time, we're gonna to try to play a short video for you that further explains our integrated service delivery model. If we are unable to get the sound to work, we have included, um, this, this video is available on our internet site at opp.ca. It's a link to YouTube, which has been included there or you could go to opp.ca, search for the billing model. There'll be a scroll for videos and click on it there. So let's see if we get some sound here. Thank you, Christine. The Ontario Provincial Police operate out of host detachments, satellite offices, five regional headquarters, one divisional headquarters, and a general headquarters. With a footprint that covers more than 1.1 million kilometers of land and 100,000 kilometers of waterways, the OPP currently provides policing services to more than 320 municipalities on a cost recovery basis. Detachments operate on an integrated service delivery model, which allows for the blending and sharing of resources. Detachment officers provide policing services to one or more municipality and also provide policing services on King's highways, provincial parks and waterways in accordance with provincial obligations. Officers in detachments are not designated as municipal or provincial officers and will often work in multiple locations during a shift. Integrated service provides the OPP with more flexibility to meet changing policing demands at a lower cost than having one standalone detachment serving a single municipality. It allows municipalities and the province to share the cost of detachment supervisory and administrative positions and detachment infrastructure. Combining the resources required to police multiple municipalities within one detachment provides a larger number of officers to draw on for major occurrences and emergencies. Detachments can direct more resources to a major occurrence without relying on overtime. The integrated service model also allows for coordinated policing strategies for issues that often span multiple jurisdictions. Being part of a larger regional type policing model offers communities the opportunity to engage and partner with other community safety and wellness agencies outside of municipal boundaries. Regional and general headquarters supply regular and specialty resources to detachments as needed. The OPP utilizes daily activity reporting as a system to record the time and location an officer works to ensure municipalities do not pay for provincial policing obligations. The OPP does not typically provide a standalone or independent policing option as the integrated model is more efficient and works best with the OPP's footprint across the province. And I think we'll get back to the slide presentation here now. Thank you very much and kudos to your staff for getting that video to play. That's a uh, good job. Alrighty, next slide, please. Over the next several slides, we'll go over information relating to the transition contract, staffing numbers, 
as well as the contract proposal costs. Should Cabin Monaghan accept the OPP's proposal, you will enter into a transition contract before being integrated into the OPP billing model. Next slide, please. There are two main reasons for the transition contract. Primarily, Ontario Regulation 267-14 was enacted on January 1st, 2015, and this deals with how the OPP bills municipalities for policing. New municipalities transitioning to the OPP need to go through a transition contract before being integrated into the current OPP billing model. This applies to the Township of Cavan Monaghan. Secondly, the collection of workload data. In order for the OPP to effectively integrate new municipalities into the current billing model, we will require workload data from the municipality while being policed by the OPP. Specifically, activity reporting data and calls for service data within our systems and databases used in the OPP billing model. In order to accomplish this task, municipalities are required to enter into the three plus year contract first so that the activity data can be collected from officers working in the township. Next slide, please. The transition contract is based on full-time equivalent resources, or as we refer to them as FTEs. As such, the agreement provides your town with a defined number of contractual hours of service. One uniform FTE is equal to 1,417 hours. This is an availability factor used to identify time spent in your community where an officer is providing proactive policing service or responding to calls for service. They are what we call boots on the ground hours. If you're wondering why the plus in the three plus years, it's because the contract ends at the end of a calendar year so that it aligns with the OPP billing model, which is based on a calendar year. For example, if Cabin Monaghan were to sign a contract starting in October 2021, it would expire on December 31st, 2024. The length of the transition contract would be three years plus three months, after which Cabin Monaghan would be billed based on the OPP billing model. Uh, a little bit of information regarding the OPP billing model. Our current billing model for municipal cost recovery is provincially focused, meaning it's based on the services we provide to all municipalities we recover policing costs from. Base service costs represent the municipal costs related to proactive policing services, such as routine pat patrols, crime prevention, ride programs, and additional activities such as training and administration. It is billed on a per property basis. The cost to each municipality is determined by the number of properties in the municipality multiplied by the standard province-wide cost per property rate. Calls for service costs are calculated on a four-year rolling average and the municipality is billed for their usage as a percentage of the provincial total. And there's more information about the billing model available on opp.ca. Next slide, please. Okay, so this chart outlines the breakdown for the staffing structure. The middle column shows the number of staff at the Peterborough County OPP detachment. The last column shows the portion that the Township of Cavan Monaghan would be responsible for during the transition contract period. And this is the column that I'll be focusing on. Our proposal is based on providing the equivalent to seven constable positions to the Township. As part of the integrated detachment, 
Kevin, Kevin Monaghan's share of the detachment commander has been calculated at 0.10% as shown here in the last column. The percentage represents Kevin Monaghan's share of the uniform complement, which is seven of 76 uniform FTEs. Similar percentages have been applied for supervisory and administrative supports for the constables policing the township. Altogether, Kevin Monaghan would be provided the services of and billed for 7.71 uniform FTEs and 0.51 of a civilian FTE for administrative purposes. Next slide, please. The following information on the next three slides is found on page eight of your contract policing proposal. I'll give you a, a minute or less to turn to that page if you would like to. I have broken up the costing summary into three separate sections. The notes with further clarifications of each section are actually found on page nine of the proposal document. Starting at the top with uniform members, the positions column indicates the total of FTEs billed to the municipality with the next gray column indicating the associated salary rates for each rank listed. And then the calculated cost for your municipality is in the total column. Salary rates for each rank are based on weighted averages by rank level and classification. Overtime, statutory holiday payout and shift premiums Estimates are also included. Overtime will be reconciled to the municipality based on their actual overtime incurred in the applicable year. Shift premiums are reconciled to the provincial average for the billing year. Below the uniform member section, you will see the detachment civilian member section indicating the 0.51 civilian FTE for detachment administrative clerk. The associated salary is listed in the gray column next to the position indicated. And in the final total column is 0.51% of that salary. Next slide, please. Looking at the middle of this page are the charges for the support staff salary and benefits. Examples of support staff include dispatchers, guards, technology and radio support staff. For a police service to function, we require support staff. These support services are billed on a per uniform officer basis. For Kevin Monaghan, the calculation would be the middle column or gray column multiplied by 7.71, the number of Kevin Monaghan FTEs. And that what is what is resulting on the on uh, the last column to the, to the right-hand side. It's important to note that these are a fair representation of the costs to provide municipal policing and that they may not be all inclusive, inclusive. The addition of a new cost to the formula may require treasury board approval. Next slide, please. At the bottom of this page is the section titled other direct operating expenditures. Expenses in this area include the provision of our provincial communication center and regional headquarters support. We also recover for other direct operating expenses on a per officer basis. So again, to calculate these expenses, you multiply the middle column by 7.71. Next slide, please. Contract initial costs are seen on page 10 of the proposal document. Upon transi transition, there are initial startup costs with respect to equipment and vehicles. The quantities are listed there along with their associated costs. 
These are a one-time only cost applied at startup. For Kevin Monaghan, the total initial costs for two vehicles and associated equipment is just under $126,000. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the 2021 estimated policing and initial costs that you will find in your proposal. You have $1.2 million for uniform salary and benefits, including the civilian salary and benefits. Uh, almost $136,000 for support staff salary and benefits. ODOE of $113,000 for the total estimated annual policing costs of $1.449 million. The one-time equipment and vehicle initial costs are almost $126,000. And this brings the total estimated cost at $1.575 million. This proposal is valid for six months from today's date, which is September 15th, 2021. A decision by council can be made at any time within this six month period. The township must also review other financial considerations that are not part of this proposal, including the cost of maintaining your police services board. Next slide, please. If the municipality chooses to accept the OPP proposal, policing services will be provided from the Peterborough County OPP detachment located in Peterborough. Next slide, please. In the next few slides, I'll provide an overview of the resources and services that are available to your municipality that are managed at provincial and regional levels. Next slide, please. Although the OPP is large, the members that serve Cavan Monaghan will continue to provide policing services that caters to the people and the needs of your community. There are benefits and economies of scale that come with being part of a larger organization. Should your town accept the OPP proposal, you will receive extensive administrative and operational support from our general headquarters here in Aurelia and our regional headquarters, which is also located in Aurelia. Next slide, please. Available to Cabin Monaghan are many OPP specialists that will assist local members by providing them with investigative expertise and support as needed. A full list of programs and services can be found on page 10 of the 2019 annual report. Next slide, please. By choosing to be policed by the OPP, you are contracting a turnkey operation. We do all the heavy lifting, so to speak, leaving your police service board to engage with the detachment commander to ensure areas of concern are addressed. We assume responsibilities of recruitment, training, payroll, freedom of information requests, policy development, and maintenance, all conducted internally, alleviating work to the municipality. With over 100 years of policing experience in both rural and urban settings, policies are developed and maintained to improve policing and limit risk. The OPP is liable for any damages that arise from any neg negligent acts or omissions of its members. Next slide, please. The in-service training unit offers professional instruction to OPP employees for <clears throat> mandatory training in the areas that you see here on the slide. The in-service training is a division of the OPP Academy located in Aurelia at our general headquarters. There are 15 deployed IST sites across the province providing training for every region. To support continuous learning, the OPP 
hosts frequent lunch and learn sessions on a variety of topics related to human rights, diversity, and inclusion. These sessions are made available to all OPP uniform and civilian members via a webinar. You don't have to be in Aurelia to view them. For those people who are unable to attend the live sessions, recordings are made available on the Provincial Police Academy's online learning portal. The OPP has partnered with the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Occlusion to provide access to their training, research, reports, and other events. Each month, the CCDI hosts educational webinars offered in both French and English. Other courses that are related to diversity and inclusion include the Indigenous Awareness course, strongly recommended for all OPP frontline and specialized members who work closely with First Nations police services and communities. Also positive space training, adapted from the Ontario Public Service training. This peer-based training promotes an LGBTQ inclusive, welcoming and supportive environment. Next page, please. The OPP is accountable to the municipalities that we serve at all levels of our organization. This is affirmed provincially by our Commissioner Thomas Kareep and regionally by Chief Superintendent Dwight Peer, who's the commander of Central Region, and locally by your detachment commander. Listed on this slide are some of the program supports provided at the regional level including criminal investigations, dispatching, and media services. Next slide, please. At this time, I'd like to pass the presentation over to Inspector Lisa Darling to provide you with information regarding your local service delivery. Thank you, Linda. Good afternoon, Your Worship, members of council, municipal staff and everyone watching virtually. For those of you who don't know me, I've been the detachment commander in Peterborough Detachment since December of 2018. I grew up in the Peterborough area just outside of Lakefield and Selwyn Township and I'm in my 26th year with the OPP and like so many members in our detachment where Peterborough County is their home, we tend to find our way back here. I started my career in West Region in 1995. I spent the first 11 plus years with the majority of my time there in Lambton Detachment. I moved to General Headquarters in Aurelia in 2007, where I spent close to eight years in various roles, including a contract analyst and transition coordinator for the municipalities amalgamating to the OPP. As a staff sergeant, I held the position of executive officer for the Deputy Commissioner of Traffic Safety and Operational Support, prior to being fortunate enough to have additional opportunities to manage corporate communications and the project management office for the OPP. All of this to say that I have had a very diverse and blessed career and where and this career has allowed me to learn a great deal. Uh, I have a very good understanding of our organization and all the resources and skill sets available to assist us, not just in emergency situations, but in all aspects of our work each and every day. I often describe the OPP as much as many smaller services that are part of a larger family. We function day to day pre predominantly by the members in our detachment but if we need them, we have access to everything our greater family of the OPP has to offer. For instance, Linda spoke to the provincial and regional supports. We're very fortunate here in Peterborough. Uh, we have several supporting units that are based out of Peterborough Detachment, providing us daily access to expertise in traffic, organized crime enforcement, the chief firearms office, criminal investigations and identification services. I'm sure you can tell I'm very proud uh, to be a member of the OPP, but what I'm most proud of as our detachment members, I know that mo the most important and valuable aspect of our commitment to community safety comes from these the men and women who work here at the detachment. I spent the last six years as a detachment commander, first in Northumberland County and now in Peterborough, and it's been the most rewarding time in my career. We have an amazing group of officers to serve and protect the communities and, communities and citizens within Peterborough County. And in the next few slides, I'm just gonna give an overview of what's available to you locally and how we deploy our detachment resources. 
could you next slide please thank you this is just a, a zone map that gives you an indication of how we deploy our frontline patrol officers so you can see we have four zones these zone officers are primarily responsible to respond to calls for service and do proactive patrol in our communities. When Kevin Monaghan was policed by the OPP prior to 2015, you were part of zone one. If you were to return to the OPP, you would again become part of our zone one. If you go to the next slide, please. This is just an example so you can see a closer up where zone one, Tonneby South Monaghan and Kevin Monaghan make up uh, the entirety of zone one. Next slide, please. This slide just gives you an overview of our structure within Peterborough Detachment. You can see at the top, Detachment Commander, that's me. Uh, I think most of you know Chris Galeazza. He's our Operations Manager. He's the Detachment Manager that you can see over to the left. And he has the majority of, uh, of people reporting to him from there. You can see our four platoons starting on the left side, platoon A to D. Those are your frontline platoons that will be responding to calls for service. We also have a Community Directed Patrol Unit as well as um, a community street crime unit and a crime unit, as well as our administrative responsibilities taken through our court officers and our administration. As well, you can see in the corner, just the bottom, we also have an auxiliary unit here and they fall under the community mobilization unit, which I'll talk about uh, shortly. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> So this is just gonna go into each of the areas that you saw on that org chart in a little bit more detail. So this is our uniform patrol. Oh, sorry, right there, thank you. Um, constables assigned, these are the four platoons we spoke about. So constables assigned to these platoons are the members responding to your calls for service and the proactive patrolling of your ro roadways, the neighborhoods and the community gathering areas on a daily basis. Our frontline response and training includes mandatory annual requalification and use of force and investigative techniques, as well as de-escalation and mental health scenarios. They're incorporated into the annualized training. In addition to that, we also have mental health first aid and it's mandatory as well as training for all members and living works start suicide prevention training. We also offer crisis intervention training and many members within Peter Road Attachment have been trained in that. Um, although our officers are predominantly in police vehicles, uh, as their primary mode of transportation and patrol, we have 26 members trained in bicycle patrol. We have six bicycles, four purchased by the OPP, and two graciously were donated by the Crime Stoppers Program in Peterborough, Northumberland. Um, and we move those around the county as need be. We also have general patrol members trained in motorcycle, motorized snow vehicles, ATVs, and marine. And they assist our community direct patrol unit to fulfill community policing responsibilities on platoon. So the resources, and we have two boats, two ATVs, two motorized snow vehicles, and two motorcycles uh, that are out of Peter Road Detachment. And as stated previously, all officers on platoon have enhanced mental health and de-escalation training, as well as standard field sobriety testing. So that is training. So that's for detecting impairment by drugs and or alcohol. Each platoon also has officers that are trained as drug recognition experts, intoxilizers technicians, and scenes of crime officers. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is our community directed patrol unit. And this unit was actually brought into Peterborough Detachment in part as a response to the comments made during the last Cabin Monaghan costing where concerns were brought forward regarding our responsiveness to community events and community based patrols. These members primary focus is on our specialized patrols and our community events. Officers in this units are trained in Marine, ATV, motorized snow vehicle, motorcycle and bicycle, as well as having specialized training to support our detachment members in their investigations with traffic collision investigation and intoxilizer. This unit often works alongside our frontline members and members of our community mobilization unit. Next slide, please. So this is our community street crime unit. This unit was created in 2017 in April. Uh, it, it's a partnership between our Organized Crime Enforcement Bureau and Field Operations, which is our detachments. Our unit here consists of nine members. It's led by a detective sergeant that's actually out of our Organized Crime Enforcement Bureau, but he is um, deployed to this area. And we have four detective constables out of the Peterborough detachment and four detective constables out of Northumberland's detachments. 
The Organized Crime Enforcement Bureau Sergeant has a hybrid reporting structure. So he reports to his management in OSEB. We'll call organized, it's OSEB for lots of acronyms in the OPP. And uh, also to us as detachment management here in Peterborough. Our unit focuses on local community issues. They're targeting specific crimes associated with street level drugs, property crimes and firearm related offenses within our communities. These types of crime crimes are intertwined and investigating these offenses across many borders. But like so many aspects of our organization, our team is but one of 23 community street crime units across the province. There are 184 members in, this, uh, un in these units deployed across the attachments and they're available to assist us and provide expertise as required. This unit's primary role is, investiga is investigative work, sorry, this primary, primary investigative role is to work collectively with our teams and our policing partners to determine the sources of drugs that are directly impacting our local communities and take proactive enforcement on these, uh, regardless of the location or the jurisdiction of that source. This unit's been extremely successful. We're very fortunate here. We have an amazing team here in Peterborough and Northumberland. Uh, their success is based on the fact that they're local members. Uh, they know, the, they have intimate knowledge of our issues uh, facing our communities and they serve they, the communities they serve and they enjoy strong relationships with detachment members as well as the Organized Crime Enforcement Bureau. In addition to the street level drug investigations and property crime offenses as their primary focus, their mandate also includes conducting parallel drug investigations for all non-fatal and fatal overdose incidents as reported. And as we know, that's a significant issue um, affecting us all now. They are also our lead in our wanted persons and our crime abatement program. So they're a very important role, important unit within our detachment. Next slide, please. So this is our major crime unit. So we have six detectives and a detective sergeant that is again out of Peterborough, but is a deployed resource from our region. The detective sergeant again has a hybrid reporting structure to myself and Chris and also to regional command. And this allows information sharing and collaborative investigations between major regions, major crime units, all the crime units in the, in the central region. The detectives are trained in major case management, homicide investigation, death investigation, sexual assault investigations, offenses against children, human trafficking, fraud investigation, hate bias crime, gang investigation, elder abuse, covert online investigations, and search warrant writing and various evidence collection courses. We know that most crime today has a digital component. These officers have extensive training in evidence collection, including the extraction of digital evidence. A Celebrate Digital Evidence kiosk is located within our detachment in the major crime unit, and officers have training and the ability to gather quick focused evidence from cellular devices. For more complex or sensitive investigations, the detectives also work directly with our regional digital forensic analyst or the OPP Provincial Digital Forensics Unit for state-of-the-art digital evidence collection. You can see in the top left corner of the slide, we also have mentioned their victim services. So our victim services is housed out of our detachment and they work closely with our crime unit, our frontline members and our mental health unit to support victims of incidents where there's been police involvement throughout the county. Next slide, please. So this shows our emergency response team and this is the Central East team. This would be the team that predominantly um, works in the Peterborough detachment. Central region itself has 44 emergency response team constables, three sergeants and one staff sergeant. As I said, this is the Central East team and Peterborough detachment has four emergency response team members here. And we're fortunate that, fortunate that one of our emergency response team members is a search manager and another one of our members uh, is trained in piloting unmanned air systems. So we have 44 remotely piloted aerial systems across the province um, that we have access to, and we have three that we use predominantly and have uh, direct access to here in Peterborough County. We also have a canine unit deployed out of Peterborough County. So again, talking about other resources that aren't necessarily detachment resources, but are, but are actually deployed here. Uh, the primary function of the emergency response team is search and rescue. I'm sure you've heard a lot about that lately in the news. Uh, canine backup, containment, building and structure clearing, um, and assisting our crime units, our organized crime enforcement bureau, and most recently our community street crime units on entries and drug eradications. Next slide, please. 
So this is our community mobilization unit. So this unit focuses on education and proactive engagement to minimize victimization and support individuals by connecting them with the supports that they need. Uh, they partner with community groups and policing and municipal partners to work together to develop multi-sector approaches to safety and well-being. This unit works alongside our frontline officers as added support. And this includes our mobile crisis intervention team, our school resource officer, our community services officer, and our auxiliary unit. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna go briefly into the pieces of that community mobilization team. So this is our mental health crisis intervention team. This team is made up of one dedicated officer within the OPP, and one mental health clinician funded by CMHA. This team assists frontline members with initial calls for service and, and where there's a mental health component that's been identified. And a significant portion of their work is related to ongoing supports for individuals identified by members through the brief mental health screeners. Uh, the brief mental health screener or BMHS is required to be completed for all calls with a mental health component. Our mobile crisis intervention team reviews these reports and conducts the appropriate reach outs and referrals. Next slide, please. So this is our school liaison officer, or resource officer. Our school officers engage with all the schools throughout our detachment area. He's responsible for delivering the OPP kids program, as well as additional programming with initiatives for youth at, of various ages. Lakefield College School, for instance, brings classes into Peterborough Detachment on a semi-annual basis to learn aspects of policing as part of their curriculum. So currently he's responsible for 10 grade schools, two high schools, two Montessori schools and a Christian school. Next slide, please. So our community services officer takes the lead in coordinating events for us, as well as participating, as well as our participation in community events throughout the county. He does this alongside his role as our media liaison officer our media officer. Some of the groups he's involved with include the Peterborough Drug Strategy and seniors and law enforcement together. Uh, he also presents to community groups on topics ranging from drugs, internet safety, bullying, driving, elder abuse prevention, frauds, and scams. He also works closely with our school resource officer to coordinate local fundraising initiatives. Recently, they did a food and clothing drive for our schools and needy families in the area. Next slide, please. Thank you. This slide is on our auxiliary program. So our auxiliary program locally, as said before, consists of 14 members. It includes two sergeants and a staff sergeant. Uh, the auxiliaries are volunteer members that assist the OPP officers. These members, these members receive extensive training that is updated on an annual basis and many aspects of the training mirror that of our uniform members. Their duties may include patrols with regular members and assisting with community events, seatbelt clinics, ride initiatives, safety displays, presentations, victims assistance, and ceremonial duties. Next slide, please. So this slide is more speaking to our accountability as a detachment to you, Kevin Monaghan. So police service boards, as you know, play an important role in determining the objectives and the priorities for the provision of police services. Under the current legislation, as Linda said, Kevin Monaghan would be responsible for a police services board. Um, if you chose to um, opt for policing delivered by the OPP, your board could be a three or five person board. However, this legislation is changing and I'll speak to that briefly on the next slide. Each board is responsible for a business plan, for three year business plan, each police services board. And as detachment commander, uh, I'm accountable to that board. I would be responsible for administering police services and overseeing its operation in accordance with your objectives. To assist with this, each de detachment has an action plan. So our action plan is from 2020 to 2022. Our commitment in this plan is to focus at the community level. We, with our communities and the community partners, make strides with local issues that relate to our four pillars in our plan, which are violent crime, property crime and drugs, traffic, and well-being, community well-being, and the community well-being piece would include your mental health, addiction, and social disorder like homelessness. In addition to our reporting on action planning priorities, the OPP also has standardized reporting tools that we use. So the PSB report that we currently use was developed by for detachment commanders in consultation with police service boards to fulfill our legislative responsibilities. This report summarizes required reporting on calls for service types, patrol types by hours, motorized 
motor snow, sorry, motor vehicle collisions and charges and clearance rates. Pardon me. In addition to the calls, in addition to that, there's a calls for service billing summary. I believe Linda spoke to as well. And this was developed to reflect the, the billable calls for service that make up um, when you get into the, the, the billing model that we have. Boards are required to meet a minimum of four times a year, and I'm responsible to meet with that board as your detachment commander. So I'm here now, but if I were to retire or move on from detachment commander uh, as a police services board, you play a participatory role in the selection of the detachment commander. And as I am here, you do have, uh, you are, you do participate in my evaluation on an annual basis. Another way we try to remain responsive to community needs is through a biannual community satisfaction survey. And you can see that's the most recent one in 2018, 99.8% of respondents felt safe, very safe. Uh, in Peterborough County area and 91% were very satisfied or satisfied with our ability to work with our communities to solve problems. So we are your police service uh, as detachment commander and operations manager, Chris and I, we are available to for community outreach sessions to assist you in developing your priorities for your plan. Next slide, please. And the last thing I'm gonna speak to here is the uh, Community Safety and Policing Act. So as mentioned briefly, um, this slide points to a few things regarding the OPP policing and upcoming legislative changes. So on March 26th of 2019, the Ontario, Ontario passed the Comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act, Bill 68, and established the Community Safety and Policing Act, referred to as the CSPA. Once in force, this act will replace the Police Services Act that we've all known for many years, 1990 was when it came in. The ministry is working to bring this act into force by early 2022. To do this work, the ministry has engaged several stakeholders, key stakeholders and partners, including OPP regional roundtables, the CSPA engagement tables, and the Association of Municipalities of Ontario MOU table. To bring the act into force, the ministry requires, is required to develop several matters for regulation, including uh, in, in relation to the OPP um, policing. Uh, composition of detachment boards is one of those things. So detachment board composition requirements are a minimum of five members, no, no maximum size has been identified. 20% of that board would be made up of community representatives and 20% would be made up of provincial appointees. There would be a proposal process for municipalities and First Nations within a detachment um, that meet the, in order for them to meet their composition requirements, they would indicate what they wanted to have locally. So we have been working with that. Chris and I, we do um, um, joint police service board meetings where all the boards get together and we have discussions on um, topics and issues that impact all of us. This would be one of those issues. We have, we're scheduling a meeting soon to discuss this as it, we know it's coming up again. So that is for everyone to come up with a plan that makes sense for Peterborough County. And if there is a rationale for more than one detachment board, that needs to be included in that submission. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna turn this over to Linda. Thank you, Inspector Darling. With the information that's been provided to you today, please take the time to review the proposal and to explore all of your resources. Our internet site at opp.ca has additional information about our organization and the services provided. Municipal Policing Bureau is also represented on that site. At the search bar, type in Municipal Policing and you'll find further information about the billing model and costs experienced by other municipalities that are policed by the OPP. Gather together any further questions that you may have about the proposal, and we ask that you submit them to us in writing through your CAO, Ms. Hurley. For transparency and standardized communication, we will be pleased to provide answers to your questions back in writing. Next slide, please. Should council accept the proposal, a bylaw will be required 
to accept the OPP as your policing services provider and a transition date will need to be determined. If the proposal is declined, we ask that you please notify us in writing and the process will be terminated. Next slide, please. At this point in time, this concludes the presentation and I'd like to thank you for your time today. I'd also like to thank uh, Cindy Page, CAO of At Hurley and Alana Arthurs for their assistance during this process and also Inspector Darling for assisting with the presentation. If there are questions, I'll try my best to answer them right now. If I'm unable to answer them today, I'll be sure to get you an answer and provide it back to you through your CAO. At this point in time, are there any questions about the presentation? Thank you very much, uh, Linda. Questions from members of council? Deputy Mayor Graham, I see you just took your unmute off. Go ahead. Uh, Having just uh, through you, Mayor, uh, thank you very much to the both of you for the thorough presentation. Um, having just received it this morning, I haven't gone, been able to go through it with the amount of detail that you know I intend to, but I know it's, it's taken a lot of work um, from our own staff to get here and clearly from uh, the self, yourselves and the members of your teams to pull all this together for us to have a, a, something to consider in comparison to our existing service. So. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I also wanted just to give a shout out to the members of our staff that you mentioned, uh, both past, now and present that have uh, helped in getting us to, to get to this point to have this to consider. I very much look forward to uh, reviewing it in more detail and getting those answers to the questions. So thank you. Very good. Further questions from members of council? Councillor Huntley? Through your chair, uh, I also wanna echo uh, Deputy Mayor Graham's uh, you know, a praise to the presentation is very thorough and a lot to digest. So I'm sure we'll have questions as we come forward. Um, I, I do have a question about the contract structuring. As, as you mentioned that there's a three year transition period, you know, with the 7.7 .7 FTEs, I believe it is, you know, where you, you start to do call tracking and, and kind of establishing the, you know, you know, what's here, right? Almost due diligence for lack of better terms. But then it shifts over to the provincial model which is a per household model. And is there any way to, at this point, predict what that per household model is? Because it, it wouldn't depend on what you gather in that three years, because if you're moving to the provincial model, you already know what the model looks like. And I'm pretty sure Kevin Monaghan isn't gonna swing the needle on a provincial model very far. So the, we uh, an idea on that. Through you, your worship, um, the, there is an opportunity on our opp.ca website where municipalities that are entertaining uh, the thought of having OPP police them where they can use a tool provided to estimate their, uh, what their costs would look like under the billing model. It's, um, it's called the billing estimator tool. And with that, the standard, uh, I talked briefly about the two portions of the billing model, where the first portion is the base services. And that would simply be calculated by taking your number of properties, both household and commercial and, and industrial, and multiplying it by the standard provincial rate. That rate is the same for all municipalities in the province. And currently that rate is at um, one, uh, sorry, $177.48. So that's how you would determine the base portion, which is quite simple. The calls for service portion is a little bit more complicated and you would require some data from your current policing provider, uh, data that's pretty common that's submitted to Stats Canada of your call volume. And you can put that data into the policing tool. And what it will do is it would show you what the, it would estimate what your percentage of provincial workload would be um, for this given billing period. And through that, you could identify a portion of what the calls for service costs would be. Both the base and calls for service costs are going to make up the majority of the costs um, in the billing model environment. And that tool is available on the website. Very good. Go ahead, Councillor Huntley. So, so follow up then. I mean, we've had, what, five years now, I guess, with, Prevent, or with uh, Peterborough Police, with all those numbers, plus, you know, the previous years with the OPP. So 
why aren't those numbers used to create the model? Like, why are we going back to do a transition period to reestablish numbers that we already know? The numbers that you would find with Peterborough Police Service, we've noticed over the past, have been significantly lower with the OPP. And we don't know if that's because of reporting procedures and practices. We don't know that that police service records calls the same way that we do. So we need the information in our systems based on our methods in order to predict what that actual volume of work is within the municipality. Thank you. Okay, Deputy Mayor Graham. Thank you. Through you, uh, just one follow-up question and just for clarification, with regards to the initial cost of the equipment and vehicles of the 125,000, is that uh, exclusive to the first year of the agreement in, the, in that interim period for the, I believe you said three plus years, or is that uh, a continuing initial cost that's divided over the duration of that initial transition period? That's an initial cost through you, your worship for just the initial uh, startup of the contract. It would not be uh, part of the remaining years of the contract. Thank you. Further questions from members of council? Uh, I had a few. Um, so currently who is in zone one? I'll defer to uh, Inspector Darling and your mute is on Inspector Darling for that question. Your Worship, Autonomy Smith Monaghan is in it right now. So they have dedicated officers just in Autonomy South Monaghan? And we do the highways. So what, what would have been Cabin Monaghan's area before and all the roadways in there, those are still part that we're responsible for. That makes our up zone one. Okay, so the, yeah. so the addition of, it appears two vehicles um, to the zone one, is, are those vehicles dedicated to the township or dedicated to the zone? They would be dedicated to the, to the township because it's, well, not to the township, sorry. They'd be dedicated to our, our detachment because we're integrated like we, you might need four cars one day. We use those because that's what we require with the additional FTEs to police. So that's where those bodies, it's a ratio. I don't, Linda, you can explain that, but it's a ratio for the number of um, constables. There's cars that we require for how a number of constables and that's what they are. Okay, so as far as any dedicated officers to the township, there is no dedicated hours or officers specific to the township or equipment. Linda, do you want to speak to the hours piece for this, for the transition contract? Certainly, Your Worship. The, um, the hours, basically the FTE contract is for hours per FTE, which is 1,417. It's not necessarily a dedicated officer, as we know that through the zone one, there could be multiple officers that are working either provincial or municipal duties, and then to cover off for any other vacations or things like that. Our commitment is to the hours of service. And that's specifically to Cabin Monaghan, not including Highway 115, Highway 7, it's specifically that's boots correct. on the ground, that number of hours commitment to the township. That's correct, Your Worship, and that's also specific to Cabin Monaghan, not Zone 1. It Very would good. exclude any hours provided to um, the other municipality in that zone. Excellent. Um, one of the issues of this is speaking from a council perspective, um, obviously, citizens are, are supposed to be contacting the police, obviously, for 911 calls, etc. cetera. Um, however, council fields a lot of calls relative to specific speeding issues on particular areas. Um, you name it, we get called in, noise complaints, et cetera. How is that dealt with as far as how does council deal directly with the um, policing, with the detachment, and how are, how are those complaints submitted, dealt with, and how is that feedback loop closed back off so that the councillors are made aware of what was done? Your Worship, I'll uh, start to answer that question, and perhaps if Inspector Darling wants to um, add anything afterwards. Uh, basically, 911 is strictly for emergency purposes, and members of the public or anyone is, if they needed or wanted to speak uh, to the OPP for non-emergency purposes, there's a 1-888 number 
um, that is available 310 1122 and that's how they could reach the provincial communication center um, also people are encouraged that they could dial into the uh, detachment directly uh, to speak to staff at the detachment i know during these covid time that uh, um, there's been issues in terms of uh, whether people are working from home or not. So uh, the best way is to go through the uh, the the generic, the 1888 number 310 11 22, and that will get them to the provincial communication centers for non-emergent purposes. And they would be able to link them in with the detachment commander or someone at the detachment. Um, and yeah, sorry. And I can speak just a little bit in more detail. So if there is if there is something that comes through the council members, you can send that to myself or Chris at any point. Uh, we would encourage that if they are if it's happening at that point that they should call the dispatch because the dispatch is going to get an officer there right away. Where you know if we're tied up in a in a police service board meeting, for instance, we're not going to be able to access our phone at that point. So to get the most immediate service, um, we would recommend that they call the 188-310-1122. If it's something that's an ongoing issue that's not happening at this moment, that is absolutely something that can be brought up either to your police services board, that we would be accountable to report back to the police services board, or you can call and, and we'll you know work it out and then we'll report back to the police services board, or if it's something that's going to be, depending on how often we're going to be having meetings um, and this whole process with boards. Uh, it might be something that we just report directly back to you on. Uh, there's certainly um, some items that can certainly be um, dealt with through a police services board and it serves its purpose. Uh, some things happen on a seasonal basis, i.e. back to school, we want extra policing in the school zones and crosswalks, et cetera. So those are predictable. Uh, there's other items and hot topics that come up that require a more adaptive um, response. Um, i.e. Uh, ORVs is certainly a hot topic um, that comes up and there needs to be a different sort of lens put on that. Um, but also just in regards to speeding. And what I find is they can call the, they can call the switchboard or call a number and go through that route. Um, but there's, 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 no, there's no closing of the loop. In other words, the officers may very well go out. They may do what they need to do with regards to speeding on a particular section of road. Um, but from a citizen's perspective, they may not necessarily have seen it happen. So as far as they're concerned, nothing was ever done. So what we found is that closing that loop, if it, uh, it doesn't have to involve council, but there needs to be some sort of a mechanism to close that loop. Typically they've gone through council and then I'm able to provide back for other members of council. This was done on such and such a date. This was the results. Um, and it provides them that sense of thank you. My community is being policed as opposed to, you might've already done that, but if there's no closure, um, then they feel like they've just been ignored and they get very frustrated. So I'm just wondering, what, what do you offer? What do you do in order to provide that service? So uh, what we do is um, we, have, we encourage our members, if, they're, if we have a specific complainant, we know who that person is, to stop by. We have what are called black cats. I don't know. I think we've talked about it before, actually, or sure, but they're in, we use them throughout Peterborough County to determine um, where our issues are and when our priority times are to be doing those patrols. So we'll often share that information with the complainant or um, if we, if it's say at a drive, we, they'll let us use their driveway or something to do something. We'll have those types of discussions with the complainant. We also Obviously, if it's a complaint that's come in and we bring it through the police services board, sometimes boards will actually do the letter up in response to this is what the police have done in response to your complaint. So that's another uh, way of bringing the police services board back into it to have a little bit more of a profile in relation to the police uh, responsibilities. So if a, a complaint did come into council and either you forwarded it to us directly or to the board, we could put that on the agenda for the board and that could be something that they follow up with. Super. Um, with regards to the base cost for the 2021, obviously, I'm assuming that's factored into the three months versus the full year of policing. The startup cost would be constant, but the other costs would be a quarter of. But with that in mind, what has been the typical, it indicates that the moving ahead, it would be calculated using the most current cost based on latest approved OPP cost schedules. So I know you can't predict the future, but can you give us an idea of what the percentage increase has been on that relative to the last five years? Are we talking 2% annually increase, 3%, 5%? 
I could follow up with you, your worship, to get what that actual percentage is. I can tell you, I'm I, I'm not aware of the the variations in the costing formula year to year, but the variations between our estimates and our actual billing usually fall within approximately a 1.5% since the billing model's been implemented. Excellent. Yeah, no, I'm more interested just in, it's great to know what the first year is, but if we're gonna have a ballpark what it is moving forward based on historical. I know it's no guarantee, but it certainly provides some um, assurance of what those annual increases are going to be. One of the other options, Your Worship, would be to uh, look at the um, those costs for the years that have gone past in the last couple of years versus what is estimated for 2021, and we would be able to see what the variance is there and provide that to you. Wonderful. Excellent. So we'll um, just have a follow-up and we'll get that information. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, another question with regards to not included in this proposal. Um, any applicable costs associated with the storage of electronic and physical records? Just so I'm aware, what physical and electronic records would the municipality be responsible for retaining? At this point in time, there aren't any uh, records that we've identified at this time, Your Worship. Uh, normally, we include that clause for municipalities that are bringing over a municipal police service, and there would be significant records of that police service that would either be transferred to the OPP or remain with the municipality. Uh, we have very few records at this point in time that we've identified that would require transfer. Okay, so that's something that would be minimal if nothing. Correct. Okay. Um, and then the final one, any applicable revenues uh, accruing to the municipality as a result of police activity, what would those be? Inspector Darling, or would you like me to do this? I, I can speak to that, sure. So criminal record checks, for instance, um, cl collision uh, reports that come request for that and from insurance. Um, TCI reports, sometimes we have the more technical reports that get requested as well. Those are all in relation to uh, activities that we do on behalf of the municipality. And those are um, put in as a credit to uh, the, the municipality on their billing statements. A credit, okay, very good. Excellent. All right, I, I, I'm with the other members of council in that, uh, give me some time, I'll have uh, more questions, I'm sure. Um, once I've had an opportunity to go through it in more detail, but I do thank uh, both of you very much for uh, the very thorough presentation and uh, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, one last opportunity for any members of council that have any final remarks, questions, comments before we uh, receive this presentation. If none, then thank you very much. We really appreciate uh, all the hard work that's gone into it. Um, it has been very thorough as identified. We, we certainly appreciate it. I get a motion then to receive that presentation. Deputy Mayor, or yeah, Deputy Mayor Graham and Councillor Councillor Moore. Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Mayor McFadden. Yes. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Councillor Belch. Can you hear me? Now. Can you hear me now, Mayor McFadden? I can hear you. It's just Councillor Belch that may not be able to hear you. Oh, there he goes. Councillor Belch, can you hear me? Now you're muted, Councillor Belch. You were, you did have the mute off. There you go. Yes. Wonderful. Yes, he can hear you. Wonderful. Deputy yeah. Mayor. Yes. <laughs> and Councillor Moore. Yes. Very good. Motion <laughs> is approved. Once again, thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be more questions coming to coming through. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we are going to do a brief recess for five minutes. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, is everybody back? I see uh, Deputy Tim Mayor, is. Councillor Belch is back. Councillor Moore and Councillor Huntley. Councillor Huntley is back. Yep. And Councillor Moore, looks like you just unmuted, you're back. Yeah, I'm here. Excellent. All righty. As long as we have a clerk. Yes, we do. We are set to go. Excellent. Okay. I just need to find my agenda, which is buried in this pile. Okay. So our next item is delegations, but there are no delegations. 
uh, minutes. So we have the minutes of the regular council meeting held March 1st, 2021. Can I get a motion to adopt those minutes? We've got Deputy Mayor Graham and Councillor Moore. Madam Clerk, record a vote. Councillor Moore. Yes. Councillor Belch. Yes. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Mayor McFadden. Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham. Deputy Mayor Graham. Oh, you're muted. My apologies, yes. Wonderful. Motion is carried. Not to worry, it happens multiple times by everybody, every single meeting. <laughs> Next item, minutes from the committees and boards. There's none, so we'll move right into our reports. First report, item 11.1, .1, report planning 2012-05, the Vandeboer Severance Application B-6-21, Miss Ellis. And I must say, Miss Ellis, you are all bright and I can see your face, so it, keep it up. Okay, thank you, Mayor McFadden. Planning report 2021-05 is before you today with the following recommendations. Firstly, that the Township of Cabin Monaghan support severance application B-6-21 because it conforms to the Township's official plan. And secondly, that the completed municipal appraisal form be forwarded to the Peterborough County Land Division Department. Very good. Do we have questions from any members of council? Uh, Deputy Mayor Graham. Um, through you, Mayor, not, uh, no issue with the intention or the uh, recommendation of the report, uh, but just a, a point of clarification with regards to the variation in the uh, size of the severed parcel from the, uh, the figures differing from one application to the other. Is there, uh, is there any issues with approving the recommendations as stated with the uh, existence of that variance or is it just going to be corrected or have we had in any further correspondence as to which of the two might be the more accurate? Through you, Mayor McFadden, to Deputy Mayor Graham. Um, I, the, difference, the difference between the numbers isn't gonna make a difference in terms of conformity with the township's planning documents because the severed and retained both parcels will meet the minimum lot area requirement for an agricultural parcel. When this, if the severance gets approved, uh, a survey will be required, which will confirm the size of the parcel. Very good, further questions? And just for clarification, it's being severed, but it's being joined onto the neighboring property, correct? There's no lot creation? Through you, Mayor McFadden, to members of council, that is correct. These lands are located in a prime agricultural area, so the creation of, of a farm parcel is, is permitted, but it would have to be 100 acres to be a new farm parcel. This is a lot addition, so um, the severed and retained both parcels will be at least a minimum of 100 acres in size. Very good. And the um, direction of the arrow onto the white parcel, my understanding is that's a different owner for that property? That is correct. So that the red area, which is a severed lot, is being added to that larger white parcel immediately to the west. And we have in we have in writing as part of this application from the owner in the white that they're receiving the severed component. Is that part of the application? Through you, Mayor McFadden, to members of council, yes, that's part of the application. Very good. Excellent. Any other questions from members of council for Miss Ellis? I'm going to go extra slow just to provide everybody the ability to uh, figure out their technology because it's not doesn't always work. Okay, seeing none. Then can I get a motion then from uh, council to receive the report and accept the recommendations moved by Deputy Mayor Graham, seconded by Councillor Moore. Madam Clerk, recorded vote. And just so you know, Miss Ellis, your picture just went black. <laughs> <laughs> I have amazing, moved. isn't it? Speaking I of technology. I haven't moved at all. No, no. Speaking of technology, it just does that. It's amazing. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Madam Clerk. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Councillor Moore. Yes. Councillor Belch. Yes. And Mayor McFadden. Yes, motion mm -hmm. is approved. And uh, Madam Clerk, I appreciate the change in the tone of voice because now that we've changed the order and I'm not always last, I, last, I have to pay attention to that change of voice that you have to identify the last and final vote. So thank you, that is definitely very important. You're welcome. <laughs> Motion is approved. All right, our next item is our item 11.2, report plan 2021-06, County Official Plan Project Status Report. Ms. Ellis, and you're all lit up again. Okay. 
Thank you, Mayor McFadden. Members of Council, planning report 2021-06 is before you today with the recommendation that the report be received for information. Very good. Any questions from members? Seeing none, Councillor Belch, I noticed your mute, mute is off. Do you wish to speak? No. Just wondering, oh, uh, go you Mayor, uh, when is the expectation that uh, county will uh, provide the finished product? Ms. Ellis? Through you, Mayor McFadden, to Councillor Belch. Um, the county is working with the technical advisory committee in the preparation of the plan. The county is looking at retaining a consultant to do the growth management and land needs assessment work. Uh, they are currently reviewing proposals. That work is hopefully going, depending on which consultant they choose, will be done by the fall. I believe that we're aiming to have a draft plan by the end of the year. Um, the, the, the final drop dead date to have it adopted is July of 2022. Uh, but I think everybody's interested in, in getting it out to the public and to various councils for review uh, prior to that time frame. Very good. And I guess the one comment to be made from the, count, from the county perspective is to ensure that all the supporting documentation are part of the official plan. Um, the last time we went through this exercise, unfortunately, the growth that was um, that we've just experienced with the Tower Hill South and North um, wasn't factored into any of the transportation master plan projects. So therefore the development charges that was clearly raised through Cabin Monaghan Township weren't um, certainly weren't spent anywhere near Cabin Monaghan. So it, it is important I've identified it at County Council, but just once again, to continually remind them of the importance of development charges and being um, used appropriately with the necessary transportation master plan projects. So other than that, if there's no other questions for Ms. Ellis, I will take a motion to receive that report and accept the recommendation. We have Deputy Mayor Graham, Councillor Clerk, Madam Clerk, record a vote. Councillor Belch. Councillor Belch is muted. Hello? Councillor Belch is muted. Okay. We'll move along and try and later. Okay. Yep. Okay. Deputy. Yeah. Oh. No, I'm oh. back. Uh, I'm back. So, uh, motion to receive the report and accept the recommendation. Councillor Belts, recorded vote. Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Mayor McFadden. Yes. Councillor Moore. Yes. And Councillor Huntley. <clears throat> yes. Motion is approved. Our next item is report planning 2021-07 airport updates, Peterborough airport noise exposure forecast, contours and airport agreement. And before Mr. Conley gets started, um, there was some attachments that didn't get put in. However, the most recent um, version of the agenda with does have all of the reports. So apologies that they didn't get in there um, uh, as of last week, but they're all, all there for uh, council and the public to see if they were uh, wish to see them. Go ahead, Mr. Conley. Thank you very much, Your <laughs> Worship. Um, you have before you report number planning 2021-07, airport updates, Peterborough Airport Noise Exposure Forecast, bracket NEF, contours and the airport agreement. The recommendation is twofold, that one council receive report planning 2021-07 for information and direct staff to update the Peterborough Airport noise air noise exposure forecast contours as part of its next housekeeping official plan amendment. And number two, that council direct staff to seek legal advice on providing a written notice to amend the airport agreement between the city and the township with the intent of developing a new agreement that better reflects a renewed working relationship with respect to the airport. Very good. Any questions from members we, of the council? We had a relationship? We have an agreement and it's a two pager. <laughs> and, and Mr. Connolly, we're definitely pulling upon your uh, vast experience with dealing with airports, municipalities from your past. We certainly appreciate it. And I'm sure council appreciated the 150 pages to read over the look over the weekend. <laughs> You're welcome. That's why we weren't included. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any further questions for Ms. Con Mr. Connolly? 
If none, then we will get a motion then to receive that report and accept that those recommendations. Deputy Mayor Graham and Councillor Huntley. Yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, I got Councillor Huntley. Okay. I'll, get you on the next, I'll get you on the flip side. Okay. Okay. Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Mayor McFadden. Yes. Councillor Moore. Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Councillor Belch. <clears throat> yes. Uh, motion is approved. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Mr. Conley. Our next item, Report Finance 2021-05, 2020 Statement of Remuneration and Expenses Report. Ms. Pope. Good afternoon, Council. I have before you the 2020 Statement of Remuneration Expense Report for Council's information. Very good. Questions from members of Council? Just flipping to the report. Any questions specific to it? If the, um, my suggestion is if there's going to be any modifications to the council remuneration effective for the next term of council, um, now would be the time to consider that if we wish to staff to do further investigation or to bring something back. I do believe it's important to be current, relevant, and uh, I would suggest that it is def a direct um, factor in establishing the next um, individuals that may be interested in putting their names in for council. So I, I would uh, I would like to see further information done on this. I think now is the time if we're going to do a review of those uh, salaries to ensure that we are current. Um, but I will look to the rest of council as to some direction. Deputy Mayor Graham. Through you, Mayor. Uh, the one component that I would that I would be specifically curious in is, is what other municipalities have done to uh, sort of in reaction to the removal of the one third tax exemption from from the salary uh, component of uh, municipal compensation for a uh, council. That would be one area where you know it, it has a substantial impact on the actual cost recovery. But and I'm not sure that that might have been included in, with regards to these 2020 numbers. I'm assuming, or maybe. There was just nothing done in some of those municipalities. We, I've had a couple conversations with other, uh, you know, of our colleagues around the county table, but I don't believe much was done in, in within our county for addressing that substantial change. But uh, that would be one thing I'd be curious if uh, if Kimberly could uh, explore. Okay, very good. Um, I do know that the county of Peterborough did do a um, significant yeah. um, report and background on that, um, but I'm not aware of any other municipalities doing it. And if I recall, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Pope, but I don't believe the township, I don't believe we factored in any specific changes relative to the loss of the one third tax free exemption, which clearly um, at the end of the day resulted in a well, one third basic loss of um, revenues that were previously recognized by members of council. Uh, that is through you to council, uh, that removal of the one third uh, now caused all taxation on all dollars as opposed to receiving a tax credit. And uh, the only remuneration part portion of the bylaw included increasing as per CPI with the rest of the wage grid. So you're correct, there was no separate um, review of that internally in house. Very good. Just a question I found it odd that OSM didn't have any data. Uh, I was, they were actually in the middle of transferring. There's a new uh, treasurer just recently appointed last week. I was trying to work with them to try to get some information. Unfortunately, um, they're just inundated and unable to respond at this time. Gotcha, very good. Okay, so how does council wish to, um, wish to deal with it? I do believe it needs to be reviewed. Um, quite frankly, not just in the envelope of uh, Peterborough County, but I think the bigger picture, um, because quite frankly, I do believe it has uh, significant impacts on the, number of people that are going to be interested in putting their names in in the next um, election. I'd be willing to second uh, uh, reviewing it. A review? Yeah. Do I have a mover? Or am I, I can move it. That's fine. I'll oh, move okay. it. I'll move it then and, sure. and Councillor Bell second. second. Um, Ms. Hurley, do you want clear direction or further direction? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, I do believe we need a little bit further direction. Um, Ms. Pope did provide a breakdown. So if there's something specific or, you know, what exactly are you, are you looking for more than what she's provided in her report? Okay. I don't know whether there's, um, whether the, inf the information is publicly available, but I believe working in isolation just within the, the county of Peterborough isn't necessarily 
um, to the benefit and keep in touch with um, with other municipalities across Ontario. So I don't know whether there would be further information, relevant information that would be available either through AMO or other clerks and treasurers organizations that might be able to provide some sort of background or further documentation or information relative to the compensation for municipal councillors. But clearly there's a, a massive amount and difference in compensation levels at the municipal um, perspective. And that being said, we all follow the same municipal act, have the same responsibilities at the end of the day. Um, but the difference between salaries from one to others based on strictly population um, is, is uh, astronomical. So I, I don't know whether there would be any, there's gotta be some further information relative to this of studies that have been done relative to specifically within the province of Ontario. That's more what I was looking for. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, if, if you wish for us to further this and maybe take a look and see if there's in a, other comparable municipalities that could be considered um, or what else is out there. I mean, uh, I'm sure Ms. Pope can certainly check with her treasurers. Um, but we can research it and see. I, I honestly don't know a lot off the top of my head, um, but we can certainly review that, I guess, and report back to you. Perfect. I was hoping to provide uh, more flexibility in that so that you could do that research to bring it back without narrowing it down specifically. Okay, that's fine, sir. Okay, any other questions, comments with regards to the motion? If not, Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Mayor McFadden? Yes. Councillor Huntley? Yes. Councillor Belch? Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham? Yes. Councillor Moore? Yes. Motion is approved. Thank you very much, Ms. Pope. Our next report, 11.5, Report Public Works 2021-03, Tender T-PW-21-03, Slurry Seal, Mr. Hancock. That's that liquid gold that makes us all look good. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Council, uh, <coughs> recommendation number one is that Council award the slurry seal tender TPW-21-03 to Miller Paving Limited for the amount of $221,559 with HST of $28,802.67. Total tender amount with the net HST would be $225,000. $458.44. Uh, recommendation number two is that council approve the transfer of federal gas tax reserve funds for the amount of $27,635 to cover the excess cost above the 2021 approved capital budget estimate. Um, and just below the overview, you will see a list of the roadways that are for to be treated with slurry seal this year. Those were the ones that were uh, previously have were previously surface treated last year, and that's been our practice. And I think it's uh, I, I believe it's been well received by the public. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. And I know from the comments that I received from everybody's road with which this is done, they uh, they very much appreciate it, and it does a fantastic job, and it certainly provides for a longer preservation of our uh, roads. So thank you. And I do thank you for bringing that program to us. It was probably close to a decade ago now when you first introduced it, and it says worked really, really well on our uh, road preservation. So thank you. Ten and a half years. Ten and a half years. Ten and a half. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from members of council on this wonderful program that our director of public works brought forward? Councillor Huntley. Uh, through you, Chair, um, to Mr. Hancock, did you by a chance know how much roadway we are covering on the slurry seal, like in kilometers or meters or whatever the best unit of measure? Um, we did have it covered off in the capital budget. I don't have it before me, uh, but I can certainly uh, just check that number and, and uh, provide it to you uh, through a separate email if you, if you wish. If you, if you don't mind, I'm just curious. Yep, will do. Very good. I think the... Um... Uh, on that one, other than uh, other than Darling Crescent and Jill Lane, um, the rest of them all have the meters on their uh, pictures. Um, so we could add that up. So but just with the addition of um, Darling and, and Jill, we should be able to, to have that. And I do thank you for the maps. That makes one, much more, uh, it's visual. Residents know and understand it. And when we're uh, queried on it, we can certainly provide them a, 
quick response. So I do appreciate that. It's much better than the verbal 100 meters from a mailbox to something else that that was really hard to explain to <laughs> residents. So thank you. That certainly makes our job much easier. Okay. Any Very other good. questions from members of council? Seeing none. All right. Motion then to receive that report and accept the recommendation. Yeah. We got Councillor Belch and we got Councillor Moore. Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Councillor Moore. Yes. Councillor Belch. Yes. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Mayor McFadden. Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Motion is approved. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have 11.6, Report Public Works 2021-04, Tender T-PW-21-04, Hot Mix Asphalt, Mr. Hancock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, um, through you to Council, before you two recommendations, that Council award the Hot Mix Asphalt Tender TBW-21-04 to Coco Paving Incorporated for the amount of 79790 dollars and 0.14 cents with HST of $10,372.72. The total tender amount with the net municipal HST will be $81,194.45. Recommendation number two is that council approve the transfer of funds for the amount of 5,000 from the general reserve to cover the excess costs from the 2021 approved capital budget estimate. And again, uh, there is a list of roadways that were proposed in the capital budget that were included in this tender and will be completed this year if approved by council. A list, but more importantly, a visual. Questions from members yes. of council? Okay, seeing none, motion then to receive that report and accept the recommendations. We've got Councillor Moore and Councillor Belch. Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Councillor Moore. Yes. Councillor Belch. Yes. And Mayor McFadden. Yes, motion is approved. And last but not least for Mr. Hancock, 11.7, Report Public Works 2021-05, Road Sweeping Services 2021. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Council, the recommendation before you is that Council award the road sweeping contract for 2021 to Fairview Trucking at the hourly rates quoted, quoted to an upset limit of 70,000, including net, net HST. Uh, and in the body of the report, we have covered off the quotations received. We did note that typically this would have been a tender process uh, but due to, uh, I think, volume of work and um, time of year and of the workload of some of the contractors that we were in touch with, we have elected to go to a quotation form. And since uh, these contractors, uh, two of them have uh, operated well for the municipality in the past, particularly uh, Fairview, um, we are bringing forward this recommendation to Council. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Any questions from members of council? Uh, Councillor Huntley. Uh, through you, Chair, any uh, warranty work that's covered by this sweeping, like after the fact, I know in the past few years, you know, they've, they've you know, packed up and moved on and we've come back and looked at some of the roads and there's still a fair bit of, <laughs> still a bit of sand and whatnot on them. Is that chargeable and billable to them or do they stand by their work and when they sign off that they're done, they're done? I think uh, through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Huntley, uh, last year was probably one of the years that we had some, what we refer to as callbacks. We uh, did not find some of the work was uh, totally uh, completed uh, to our satisfaction, uh, to some of the councillor's satisfaction and to residents. So we uh, tend to call the contractor back in. I think Fairview is a good example of a contractor that if it's not done well enough, they'll come back and clean it again. That's number one. Um, we, uh, both these, con the contractors that we quoted this year are contractors that are reputable and do stand by their work. And for the most part, we've had very limited complaints related to any of them. And also that we have used them if we've had situations where we've had problems with other, with other sweeping events. So that being said, uh, we typically don't pay until the project is completed to our satisfaction. 
Very good. Further questions from council for Mr. Hancock? There's a couple of mics that are open. We're getting uh, feedback just if your mic's on and you're not talking, if you could turn it off. Okay. No, nothing further then. Uh, motion then to receive that report and accept the recommendation. Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Thank you, Mayor McFadden. I need a mover and a seconder. I may have that's, missed that. I apologize. That's what I was just about to do. I got a Councillor Huntley and a Deputy Mayor Graham for a mover and a seconder. Thank you for keeping me on my toes, Madam Clerk. Now do a recorded vote. Wonderful. Councillor Belch? Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham? Yes. Mayor McFadden? Yes. Councillor Moore? Yes. And Councillor Huntley? Yes. Motion is approved. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Next item is Report Fire 2021-03, Execute an Agreement Between the Township of Cab Monaghan and Greenview Environmental Management. Chief Belfort. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. The recommendation before Council is that Council authorize the Mayor and Interim Clerk to execute an agreement between the Township of Cab Monaghan and Greenview Environmental Management and approve bylaw number 2021-15. Very good. Questions from members of council? I know the chief is very excited to proceed. Seeing none, motion then to receive that report and accept the recommendation. I got a mover from Deputy Mayor Graham and Seconder Councillor Belch. Madam Excuse Clerk, before to vote. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Councillor uh, Councillor Moore has a question. My apologies. Go ahead, Councillor Moore. That's okay. Thank you. Um, my only question, and I don't see anything in this where they're recommending um, adding the paramedic space. And I understand that it hasn't been all officially decided upon, but I do know that it'll cost a lot of money if we have to add it separately. And I'm just curious if there's any, any interest in moving forward with that, or if it's just, um, if it's just being left to be just the fire hall, fire station. Chief Belfour? Reassure us. No problem. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Moore. It's an excellent question, uh, Councillor Moore, but uh, I can confirm that we have had uh, uh, our CAO, Yvette Hurley, has arranged meetings with the county and their staff, and uh, it was brought up at uh, County Council, and they've approved uh, in principle to for us to look at uh, uh, working uh, their needs into the design of the fire hall. Okay, thank you. You're and, welcome. And further to Councillor Moore's question, then is, would there be an additional cost or charge from Greenview in order to incorporate that in? I don't believe so, Mr. Mayor. Okay, all right. Very good. Any further questions from members of council? If not seeing none, we've got a mover and a seconder and we've got a call for a recorded vote. Madam Clerk. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Mayor McFadden. Yes. Councillor Moore. Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Councillor Belch. Yes. Motion is approved. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chief Belfour. All right, next item is 11.9, Report CAO 2021-02, Facilities Review. Ms. Hurley, you look really good on this screen today and we can hear you. It's fantastic. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, the report before you is a recommendation uh, that Council receive Report CAO 2001-02, Facilities Review for Information. Um, just to give you a little bit of a synopsis on that, uh, if you remember on February 1st, Council directed staff to go back and take a look at some of the properties that we have that have facilities on them. Some of them are being utilized, some of them are not being utilized, and most of them are either older or giving an update on what our capital and operating costs have been in the last three years on those properties and what their current uses and potential future, uh, future costs may be. So I am here to answer any questions. If you would like, we could certainly go through uh, the chart that's been provided um, or uh, any further discussions on these properties. There was a chart uh, just a little bit below there that Christina has provided. Um, it should be an attachment if you keep going down. Thank you, Christina. So we did identify some of these properties um, that actually have uh, buildings on them and what our potential future costs might be when we look at these properties in the future. 
I'm happy to go through them individually, or I'm certainly happy to answer any of your questions that you might have. Very good. Excellent. I guess if we just start at the top and go through them all and, and we'll deal with them that way. So item uh, number one is the property specifically that council has already provided some direction on. So I don't know that there's any further direction to be provided at this time. I know that the staff is working hard on that particular property. So unless any members of council has any questions, I'll move along to number two. Okay. Property number two is uh, the property that was retained um, approximately 10 years ago, specifically for the uh, water potential of that property. Um, uh, once again, that is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, for future um, potential with regards to the water. There's always an opportunity, A, to dispose of it, or B, to um, sever off a portion of that property. Um, but my suggestion would be to retain it in its entirety at this point, knowing that there is a potential water source there for future needs. Um, I think we'd want to control the lands that are immediately around it. Unless there's questions or comments, concerns relative to that property, I will move along to number three. Number three is the uh, Old Millbrook School, as we know, um, currently with housing the library, as well as some community rooms that have um, not really been used in the past year with COVID, as well as our family center that is always done quite well in the basement. Any questions, concerns on utilization of the Old Millbrook School? If I may, Mr. Chairman, just Go ahead. to add to that, we do have an application in for funding for that building as well. And we're still hopeful that we may receive some funding. As you know, for the past few years, we have very high capital costs for the old Millbrook School. Um, but uh, we, we do hope to hear very soon whether or not we do receive some funding to assist us on that. Excellent. And Deputy Mayor Graham? Uh, through you, Mayor, my question was just regarding the status of that, but I understand from the CEO's comments that we haven't yet heard back, so we'll continue to wait uh, and hopefully get some support for the maintenance of that, uh, you know, very, very well regarded and, you know, obviously historically significant facility. Excellent. We'll continue to lobby our um, Minister of Infrastructure on that one, who is also our MPP. <laughs> Next item, number four, then we'll move along. 2199 Davis Road, which is the Bruce Johnson Library. Um, one thing that stands out with me on this one is relative to our long-term potential costs for the building relative to the amount of current use. Um, I know I'd certainly like uh, further investigation relative to that building as to how we can better um, utilize that building. And I think that would be a discussion that would need to be had with um, the staff at that facility, but 13 hours for a building of that size and potential long-term cost thinks needs further investigation would be my suggestion. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yeah, through you, Mayor. I, I completely agree. I was I really kind of surprised by the, the small number. I, I didn't, I could, 13 seemed astronomically low to me, but you know, I, in conversations, I understand that to be the case, but I, I sort of share your position that there has to be some service groups or other community sort of entities that could be utilizing this space for the abundant amount of hours that it is available. Um, and maybe that that would influence some of the capital decisions that we need to make moving forward to make it more accommodating to these other purposes. But I, you know, I can think of a few offhand that, you know, there's certain uh, facilities, housing, different social or socially related groups that are under, uh, you know, very much aging and very much, you know, deteriorating or going through or facing concrete renovations that maybe this entity could be something that provides more to the community in the hours that it's not being utilized as, as the library. So in addition to, you know, and in, and in fairness, the only addition I would have to your earlier comment is it, I'm not sure maybe the library wouldn't know who, but maybe staff might be able to engage with some of those exterior groups to find out what would be needed or what could be utilized in order for that facility to be viable for them. Because, you know, the library might not know those sorts of groups, but they can certainly help in figuring out what might be, you know, agreeable compromises or, or restructurings within or slight adjustments to layouts to, to make it accommodate, uh, accom more accommodable to different uh, groups. So that would be my only sort of tweak. Very good. Um, I'm going to suggest uh, provide staff with some fl flexibility. I'm going to do a motion specific to that one um, because I, I've got a, an issue with one that's coming up further down that I'm going to recuse myself from. So I'd like to deal with this one by itself and then we can move on. So just a motion to uh, direct staff 
to do some further investigations relative to the Bruce Johnson Library and its um, and its current use um, uh, and its current uses. Is that enough flexibility, Madam Hurley, Ms. Hurley? Yes. So you you want us to uh, staff to take this back and take a look at uh, off hours or talk to the library board on potential and look at other op other opportunities other for that building on their off hours times or. Just, just in general. I would just leave it just in general. Other general? opportunities for that. Open. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, so we got a mover, Deputy Mayor Graham, seconder. Did I hear Councillor Belch? Yep. Yep. Okay, Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Councillor Moore. Sorry. Yes. Councillor Belch. Yes. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Mayor McFadden. Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Motion is approved. Okay, the next item is 920 Larmer Line, which is specifically the lion's den. I'm a lion, so I'm going to recuse myself specifically for this component of it. So I will turn the chair over to um, Deputy Mayor Graham. No problem. Um, with regards to this facility to any councils, I can't see every, I don't have the <laughs> setup that the mayor has, uh, but would anyone like to speak to any of the, uh, or any questions for staff with pertaining to this specific property? Just speak up as I can't, I can see Ryan, but I can't see uh, or um, Tim or Kathy. I think we need to, uh, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, I think we need to take a look at that particular facility and decide, uh, I guess the Lions have said that they're not interested in buying it, so. Yeah, and in response to that, I know what that do the we uh, do with it? staff has had initial conversations, but it's probably going to have further conversations with the Lions. I believe, if I'm, um, if I've heard this correctly, that I, the lease with the Lions on that facility is is coming up, and I believe there's been at least um, initial conversations between staff and the Lions to obviously, you know, support uh, support this group and continue to you know provide them an opportunity to utilize other facilities, if not this facility moving forward. I think, uh, and maybe I'll ask Yvette to speak to this if, if that is indeed the case and where we're at with those conversations. And then that might, uh, and I know that there's future reports now that we've just moved forward with the, in the earlier report with regards to the uh, contract with Greenview that this, this, this specific location is one of the four that's identified for considerations for the fire hall as well. So that is another element to the conversation when it pertains to this specific site as well. But uh, Yvette, on to the point with regards to the communications with the Lions, could you provide any clarity on that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So um, I have not followed up with um, uh, the chair of the Lions Club at this time, but I do know that their lease is coming up. Um, we have expressed emails about getting together and having further dialogue um, with regards to uh, the future of of the Lions Club and and I know that that facility I'm not sure who's been in that facility lately um, the facility is getting tired um, it does need some capital works uh, done to that facility in the future but I'm happy to reach out to them further I will need to do that anyways with regards to lease but I can certainly reach out to them and see what their long-term plans are there was preliminary discussions when we were building the CMCC as you remember that they may be interested in utilizing some of the services that we offer there as well. Um, and we're certainly open for that. So uh, they are a great organization in our area and we would like to try to talk to, with them and accommodate them and, and really see what meets the needs for them in the future as well. With regards to that site being one of the sites that we'll be coming back in a further report, uh, hopefully very soon with regards to uh, a fire station location report. Um, yes, that is one of the sites but it doesn't necessarily mean that that building would have to be removed or anything. There's additional lands around that building that could be uh, utilized should that be one of the sites that council is interested in exploring further. Does that uh, answer your question, uh, Councilor Bells? Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, thanks for that, Yvette. Um, yeah, if, if I'm not mistaken, I believe there's been reoccurring issues with, with flooding in this facility in the basement specifically as well. Is that correct, Yvette? Yes, you are correct, sir. There has been some challenges uh, with a high water table that we've also had some plumbing issues there over this past winter, for sure. Um, ventilation issues, etc. 
a couple of years ago, we had some flooding issues in the basement as well. Um, mm -hmm. But again, it is a very old building um, yeah. and old buildings need a lot of care. And it's one of our one of those uh, facilities that we have that we are responsible for and we'll have to continue to plan for the future of that and do any repairs that are necessary. But yes, you are correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, Councillor Moore, Councillor Huntley? I'm good, thank you. Okay. I'm from my... Okay, and with that, I guess we can move on to the, uh, to the next facility in question and uh, we'll bring you, the mayor Mr. back to take, sorry? Did, did you want to do a motion on this one particular as well for further information or are you leaving it? I'm sorry, I just clarity, please, on that one. Uh, with regards to, I think with regards to the conversation, if you want a direction to further engage with the lion specifically, is that what you're inferring? Because if you need that direction, I'm happy to, to make that motion. I'm just bringing that to your attention because you asked for further information on the mm -hmm. Bruce Johnson Library. If you wanted further information, fine, I can do it or we can just leave it alone. It's it's council's direction. Uh, if you, I think I'm of the opinion that, you know, I want to ensure that the Lions understand and the, the appreciation and the uh, sincerity with which their contribution to the community is held by council. Um, and so I, I would, if you, if I think that that would be best served with the motion to have further ongoing conversations about opportunities to provide um, alternative, I don't want to say housing, but accommodation for, for this specific group, then I'd be happy to make that motion. Looking for a seconder. Councillor Belch. Okay, we have uh, move, I'll move it then Councillor Belch and then we'll take a recorded vote. Through you, Deputy Mayor Graham, can I confirm um, just the motion just to make sure, unless you're clear, sure. Ms. Hurley. Deputy Mayor Graham, would you like to- Sure, I can, motion? I can stab I at it. Just yeah, Thank that you. staff engage that staff engage with the uh, Millbrook and District Lions Club to explore potential alternative accommodations for the purposes for the community service that they provide. Shouldn't mm -hmm. shouldn't affect or I mean because the agreement is expiring, I would assume that would be a part of the conversation. Anyways, I see your hand, Yvette. Maybe we just simplify that, if I may. Sure. Um, Deputy Graham, just to ask for further clarification on their future use. Like, I think just keep it okay. general. Yeah. They might be sure. just, that, you know, I'm not sure if they're going to continue there or not. I don't, I don't want to presume that, uh, that there's any other conversation going on at this time, but I'm certainly take your direction to have further conversation of the future, uh, requirements yeah. or uses or needs for the, um, for the lion's den. Sure. That suffices uh, my intention with the motion. So I'm good with that. Councillor Huntley, I'm assuming that that's okay. As the second. I think it was uh, Councillor Belch. That's I have, but I'm yeah, fine I have with that. Councillor Belch yeah. is a seconder as well. It, okay. It, it's oh. okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor Very is good. fine. Thanks. Thank Perfect. you, Councillor Belch. With that, then, Cindy, I'll go to you for the uh, recorded vote. Wonderful. Deputy Mayor Graham? Yes. Councillor Huntley? Yes. Councillor Moore? Yes. Councillor Belch? Yes. Thank you. And with that, I believe we can hand the mask back to the mayor. Very good. Through the virtual mallet at me. <laughs> yeah. All right. Our next item is uh, number 6, then 52 King Street East, Station 1, Chief Belfour. All is good. <laughs> I don't think we need any further direction on it. I think council's already provided sufficient on that one. We can skip along. And I don't think the chief wants to hold us back any. Number two, Hay Street, which is the old fire hall. Um, for all intents and purposes, we have an old fire hall and, an, and another old fire hall, but this one specifically is the museum that we have um, artifacts in it. Um, I don't think there's any further works to be done at this time. I know uh, we did put some work into it, investment into it last year with regards to um, the water damage and whatnot that was occurring. And I know um, speaking to the association directly, they were very appreciative of all the work that went in. So pass along that, thanks. Unless there's any further comment, we'll move along then to the four Needlers Lane, Millbrook Arena. And um, I guess 
Um, Ms. Hurley, I guess you probably got the same comment to be made on this one as you did for the old Millbrook School with regards to funding. Yes, through you, Mr. Chairman. We have uh, made an application for funding and we are waiting for the status on that as well. Very good. Excellent. Any further uh, comments on that one? We do have direction. Seeing none. Uh, next is, is that number nine, the Millbrook Yard? We can already have some council direction on that one. Ms. Hurley, we don't need anything further on that one at this time. I don't believe so. We are looking, uh, the direction is that we're looking at a new design for the Millbrook Yard on, uh, and that will be coming back to council for approval. Okay, very good. Moving along. That, that is that's it. it. Okay, yes. that's it. We do uh, have Councilor? maps attached though, sir, should you wish to look at any of the maps. Super. Uh, okay. Councillor Huntley? Mr. U Chair, um, did we not include the, uh, the, the depot on just outside of Cabin on 10? The roads depot, sir, Councillor Huntley? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, we did not because that has a direction already given to council. Um, we could have included it because I did put the Millbrook yard on, you are correct, but um, we, you already have a clear direction and a design that has already gone before council for consideration from uh, Mr. Hancock. Fair enough. I just, it would have been nice to see it's uh, operating in capital expenses listed in the list with the rest of them. I can certainly follow up with that. Um, yeah. We did not include that because his report had a lot of that detail in it, but maybe it did not, but uh, we can certainly check and provide that to you as well. Okay, thank you. Excellent, very good. You're welcome. Is there any other buildings we forgot? I thought it was a rather um, complete list. I good, good catch, uh, Councillor Huntley. I didn't even notice that one. Yeah. Okay. All right, then a motion um, just to receive that report. Moved by Councillor Moore and seconded by Councillor Huntley. Councillor Moore. Uh, <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> we'll get you again. Okay, Madam Clerk. Mayor McFadden. Uh, yes. <laughs> Councillor Huntley. Catch off board there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Councillor Belch. Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Councillor Moore. Yes. Motion is approved. I must say, it, for for all the good reasons, it's become a completely random selection as far as the <laughs> order. But I gotta admit, it's throwing me right off uh, to hear my name right <laughs> off the bat on a motion that I didn't. <laughs> so bear with me. I, I am paying attention. It's uh, I'm getting used to these new rules. So all good. All right. Our next item then is item 11.10, report CAO 2021, report and capital project status. Ms. Hurley has the all the information before us. Is there any questions from members of council? Seeing none. Actually, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Councilor Huntley. Through you, Chair. Um, the one item, the I guess they're not numbered, but, but the the alleyway on King Street improvements. Are we? It says it's coming back in April. Is that for the improvements or kind of the findings? Like what, what exactly is that entailing that's coming back? I think Mr. Mayor, if I could- uh, Go ahead. Jump in. Just, just uh, jump in. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, directed to do a report, uh, bringing forward, uh, you know, a, a more detailed plan and uh, um, whether we might have to use expropriation with some legal input. So we are to report further on the matter in, in April of this year. Okay, so it's more of a status then, Mr. Hancock? Yeah, it's a status and, a, and an updated cost. I think we had uh, we had put an amount in the budget of 100,000. I think we wanted to make sure that it was enough funds if it is. And we also wanted to have some legal input that you could be aware of what expropriation might might include if we went that direction. Okay, thank you. Look forward to the report. Very good. Uh, just a question in, in general, uh, subdivision agreement review. Is that a particular subdivision or is that just the general? Oh, sorry, you were on the right page. Um, Christina, you were in exactly, yeah, right there. This is uh, May, 2021. 
through you, Mr. Chairman. That was a direction that council would like uh, on December 21st, that council would like Mr. Uh, Conley to come back regarding subdivision agreement reviews on the process of those reviews. Okay, okay. It's the process. It's not a specific agreement. Okay. No. Very good. Yeah. That makes sense. I recall that. Any other questions? Oh, uh, Councillor Moore. Sorry, you're, you're moving around on my screen, but I see your hand. Go ahead, Councillor Moore. That's okay. Um, I don't know if this is the right time to ask it or not, but were the fire station design, um, the photos that we saw, saw from the um, Greenview, are they the what? Are they what the um, station is hoping to look like, or does anybody have an answer to that? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman, to Councillor Moore. So we're right in the middle, obviously, with signing the contract today. Um, we will now start, uh, we'll be coming back at the next council meeting with a report regarding the possible locations. And with okay. that, uh, we will then be working with Greenview to design a facility that would also potentially include the paramedics station as well. So right. we are taking a design, the initial design that council did say that they liked was uh, with Trent Lakes design. However, yeah. it does not meet the needs in the aspect of including a paramedic section in there. So we are talking to them. So it'll probably be a, a new design, but very similar in some ways to the one that you liked in uh, Trent Lakes. Or it'll be coming a new design after having conversations further, but we will be coming back with a design for council for uh, review and consideration. Okay. My, my only concern is when we're going to be putting it near a new subdivision, that it, it, that particular one doesn't look very modern. And I think we have to think long-term so that it doesn't look like that we built it too far back, and like that it looks old. I know that's just my opinion, but I do think we need to bear in mind that there's a new subdivision going to be near it. That's just so my... Yeah, through you, uh, Mr. Chairman, to Councillor Moore, um, you have given us um, uh, a good point with regards to where that right location would be, what the design would look like. Those will be under consideration with Greenview um, for sure to make sure that we design something that lasts into the future and is also complementary to the community and the surrounding neighborhood. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. It, it sounds to me like we might be having another debate on whether the water tower is going to be white or blue, because I know that was uh, quite entertaining when that, that unfolded. Um, and it went white. Isn't and, that and it funny? Went, it white prevailed, yes. And, right. and I recall my vote swinging on that one, uh, compliments of uh, Councillor Huntley. So the, uh, I, I know we've already uh, looked at various options for, for curbside appeal to the new fire hall, and uh, I can appreciate that Council has uh, many different um, possibilities and suggestions. Uh, maybe my agricultural look didn't go over so well, but personally, I kind of like I, I like the look of that. But we will have it that kind, debate. We will have that debate of, on another day. It kind of matched my barn. It, it very much matched your barn. Maybe a nice red <laughs> barn with the, the look we're looking for a new fire hall. But yeah, we will have that discussion on another day and keep all uh, options open. Thank Regardless you. Regardless where we end up, I know we'll uh, we'll all agree to uh, to, to be to endorse the, the new fire hall and uh, the chief is very much looking. For. Okay, if there's nothing further on that report, then I would get a motion to uh, receive that report. Moved by uh, Councillor Moore, seconded by Deputy Mayor Graham. Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Councillor Moore. Yes. Councillor Belch. Yes. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Mayor McFadden. Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Motion is approved. Uh, next item is 11.11, .11, Council Committee Verbal Reports. Uh, Deputy Mayor Graham? Uh, nothing at this time. Uh, Councillor Huntley? Um, nothing at this time. Councillor Belch? Uh, through you, Mayor, uh, have a, uh, a Ganaraska board meeting uh, this coming Thursday evening. Very good. Councillor Moore? Nothing at this time. Very good. Uh, from myself, the uh, policing task force, the information that we received today from the OPP, along with information that we're going to be getting from the city police, will be forwarded on to the policing task force to come back to council with our recommendations. So that is 
that's the current status of it. And uh, Ms. Hurley has stepped in as the replacement for Ms. Arthur's on that committee. Thank you, Ms. Hurley. So I'm gonna get a motion then to receive those verbal reports. We've got Councillor Belch and Deputy Mayor Graham. Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Councillor Moore. Yes. Councillor Belch. Yes. Mayor McFadden. Yes, motion is approved. Uh, next item is the addition. It's item number 12 under general business and it has to do with the vaccination clinics. Ms. Hurley, this has become your other life. All of the information on COVID and the vaccinations and everything you've been doing for the last week. Can you provide an update and current status of where we're going on the COVID vaccination sites, please? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So the, what I would like to talk to you about a little bit today is the last few weeks and uh, have been for conversations with um, preparing the province and uh, the local PPH preparing for vaccination centers. Um, recently, last Friday, we did receive a call. Uh, we had a call with the CAOs and uh, PPH is asking for two things for municipalities, two items to assist municipalities. The first one was that they were asking if for the three locations that are going to be up and running in phase one, which is the Evan Root, the Peterborough Hospital, and uh, the Norwood Community Centre, they're asking that uh, each municipality in Peterborough County provide potentially two volunteer firefighters um, to assist with volunteering at these locations. Um, they, they could be uh, retired or auxiliary. Um, Fight, uh, volunteer firefighters, but each municipality has been asked to provide two for consideration uh, in assisting if needed. It is not a guarantee, but it is uh, something that uh, they would like to have um, that uh, support um, starting, and I believe starting next week um, at between Monday and Friday of each week, if required. Again, it, there is a lot of questions if, if, uh, out there right now, whether or not they need it or not need the assistance, but I, I believe right now they're looking for assistance. The other item to that is to, which is transportation. And that is to help residents that are over the possible in the phase two, which are over the age of 80, that may not have any type of transportation um, to get to one of these sites after they have their booking uh, for their vaccination, which is going online today. So the question is, you know, if you, if, if, we do have a resident in our area that may be over the age of 80 that is living alone, may not have friends, family, assistance, may not be a part of community care or any other type of service that can provide a, a drive uh, to get a vaccination. We are asked to provide some type of connection or support for them. We did speak to, uh, briefly about you know, service clubs in the area or taxi services in the area, but it came down to, is there any other option that could be considered for us um, and the, um, the fire chief and myself and Mayor McFadden spoke briefly with regards to our volunteer firefighters and to see if they could potentially provide that um, service if required. Again, our volunteer firefighters, um, frontliners, um, paramedics, et cetera, have all been vaccinated. So that is one good thing. We do have a question regarding insurance that we're exploring right at this moment, but they are looking for this um, information of who would be able to provide a transportation service within our municipality if the need was there. Very good, and questions from members of council? Oh, go ahead, sorry, Ms. Hurley. No, I was just going to add through you, uh, Mayor McFadden, that uh, Deputy Mayor Graham might be able to support some of this discussion through his, his you know, sitting on the uh, Peterborough House uh, Board as well. I know that they've talked about uh, some of this information and the the need for volunteers throughout Peterborough County. Uh, Deputy Mayor Graham. Yeah, thank you. It's through you, Mayor. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm. With regards to my comments, I, I held back from from having a verbal report on this, knowing that this was coming forward on uh, March 10th at the public health meeting last week. We were sort of given uh, the initial sort of information from public health as to sort of the vaccination rollout plan. Um, and Yvette has mentioned, you know, a lot of the high level discussions with regards to how we're going to start this effort locally 
And the first age group that's going to be addressed is, is 80 plus, which I believe is from born from 1941 and uh, more recently. Um, but the expectation is that, you know, that's where it starts and then it will be increased over five year intervals uh, over the next few months once the 80 and over group is uh, completed. So this is how we're going to be moving forward. Um, you know, there has been initial discussions about uh, expanding the locations for different facility, uh, facilities locally, uh, of which the CMCC is one that has been offered. And we did uh, double down on our offer to utilize that facility in the vaccination plans. Um, at this point, for this initial phase, that wasn't deemed necessary. I think there's, there's sort of an incremental rollout to how we're going to interact with this COVAX system from the province and you know, get everyone through into the appropriate location for the vaccination. Uh, so this is sort of the start of that effort, which, you know, I, I hope is met with excitement because I know it was exciting for me. You know, there hasn't been a lot of exciting things coming from my engagement on Peterborough Public Health, but this was by far the, the most exciting, knowing that, you know, it's nice to hear that vaccines are coming, but it's nice to see and see dates within the next week that they're being put into the arms of the generic public and those specifically most at risk, which we all know is a substantial demographic in both in our township and us in the county as well. So, you know, there is going to be some information with regards to phone numbers, uh, with regards to web booking. Uh, there will be a call in booking uh, availability for those that aren't so technically savvy to, to go through Peterborough Public Health. Uh, I went online this morning and there is information on the Peterborough Public Health site to help you know, navigate to the you know, appropriate channel to get into the provincial COVAX booking system to get your vaccination. Uh, but do not overwhelm. I think the only thing that we could ask is, is don't overwhelm it. Understand that this initial wave is specifically designed for those 80 plus individuals. And that as we move forward in, into the younger and younger demographics, there will be more and more, you know, probably availability and locations with which vaccinations will be administered. Um, but we're trying to sort of start small and where it's most needed and, and go from there. And I think it's a, it's a good plan and I'm happy to see that it's, it's starting sooner than later. Um, but I'm happy to answer and try to provide any form of clarity that I can. But I think it's important that we don't try to, you know, reinvent the wheel when it comes to the communication piece that, you know, we, I think our role as a municipality and as politicians will be to sort of help disseminate that local information um, and try to, you know, be a bridge to get individuals that aren't familiar or maybe less tech savvy or that we know might be sort of remote from hearing about this effort and the information that maybe we take that opportunity to reach out and, and sort of fill those gaps and ensure that, you know, as many residents are aware of this as possible. And I know the mayor and I have had an initial conversation about uh, when we get that specific local phone number and website information that this be included into the uh, tax, uh, the one page uh, tax mm -hmm. brief that comes out annually as well. And I think there's an uptake on that from staff as well. So that will be sort of the start, but that's sort of my summary as to where we're at right now, but happy to answer any questions if I can. Very good. Um, I'd like to bring forward, we can have a good discussion on this. I'd like to bring forward a, a motion a, a, on this particular topic to provide some flexibility, both for our CIO and the chief. Um, to do what is deemed necessary so that they don't have to keep coming back to council, more specifically to um, from a budget perspective. Um, I think it's uh, imperative of all of us to provide them with that flexibility to ensure that they can do whatever is needed by our, our firefighters and, um, and the CAO, um, whether it's transporting or taking um, people to vaccination clinics, uh, whatever unfolds. Um, but I think we're all on the same page on this one. And uh, I think it is really important. I know our, our residents are certainly very anxious. I know I'm beginning to receive phone calls relative to how do they, what do they need to do? Who do they need to contact? Um, but one of my biggest concerns in all of this, is, and I believe we need to get out in front of it as a community, is the misinformation that is out there, uh, or, or maybe it's not misinformation, but the, there seems to be abundance of information that doesn't necessarily reflect everything that we're being told. So as a simple example, um, on CP24, um, it was, it's being circulated that in Peterborough, that your doctors are going to be contacting you in order to set up your vaccination. So, which is completely different than any of the information that we've been receiving from the health unit. Um, so I think we as a municipality uh, can do a wonderful job if it's through the inserts in the tax bills, 
Um, but even furthermore, if we can get that message out specifically to the most vulnerable aspect, they're not going to be on social media. There's no sense sending them to websites. Um, we need to get that information out in front of them. I know we did a wonderful job um, with our ward boundary review advertising on the radio. Uh, you know what, for that demographic, that may very well be what works. Let's take a look at and provide that flexibility for our staff to, to do what is deemed necessary but we really need to get the direct messaging out on behalf of the township of Monaghan, specifically for our residents to ensure that they're getting the accurate information. So that would be my suggestion when we're, it's time for a motion to provide uh, our staff with that flexibility. Any further questions, uh, uh, Councillor Huntley? Uh, to you, Chair, I'm on a side note, I, I just noticed that the, uh, the Peter examiners already launched the, uh, or posted stories about online bookings are now available within the last half hour. So the, the information is coming out fast and furious. Super. Uh, uh, sorry, um, Ms. Hurley? Yes, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, all the information has been released today. Today was the day, uh, the 15th to release. So um, the information is on their website, uh, the PPH uh, website, the uh, Ontario.ca slash book vaccine is on their website. It talks about their... Uh, for residents that like to book for a phone number, there is the direct local number now that's on there. So we do have information that was sent out to us today. Um, and all of this information will go out through, uh, we will push it out through our uh, social media uh, platforms as much as we possibly can. But um, in support of what Councillor Huntley was just saying, I think you'll see a lot of information starting today getting pushed out, be in the papers as well. And uh, the more that we can do to let the residents know where to go for this information, how you get their booking, how they can book for the vaccine, where those vaccine clinics are, et cetera. And if we can make it as clear as possible for our residents, it's really important right now. And you're right. There is a lot of confusion. And I, I will let you know, honestly, um, every day is a new day here. We change and roll with the new changes that are coming down and we try to accommodate the best we possibly can. I know that, um, Peterborough Public Health is also trying to accommodate as these things are coming through, but they are coming fast. We had three meetings. I know I had three meetings last week alone. Um, it's a lot of information and everyone is trying very hard to, to, to do and, and get everyone vaccinated as much as possible. I think it's a critical time for us for sure. And uh, Deputy Graham um, is correct that it will expand their they are coming next week um, and potentially even sooner. I said I was certainly available to show them the CMCC. Um, so we will keep you posted and uh, try to keep you updated as much as we can, including our residents in Cabin Monaghan. Very good. Anything further? Uh, Deputy Mayor Graham. Uh, thank you and through you, Mayor. Um, thanks, Yvette, for that. That's, that's excellent, I'm glad to hear. I just, two things. I just wanted to thank the chief and uh, all of the volunteer firefighter staff for, for for being willing to step up to this. It's gonna be such a vital contribution, um, you know, to, to our community. And, uh, you know, it's just another display of, you know, the value that, you know, and the fortunate circumstance that we're in with the volunteers being so ready and willing to take on this initiative. Um, and I appreciate uh, our staff's coordination and effort to work with them to sort of help facilitate that. So that's just excellent and uh, very much appreciated. And the only other thing just I wanted to, to make mention of is, is there is a, uh, it's a bit of a sensitive issue. There is some information or there is a, a press briefing tomorrow morning. Um, this has been a stressful circumstance for a lot of, for everyone, uh, you know, point blank. Um, but when it comes to the individuals that you might come across or interact with from a public health standpoint that will be involved with this vaccination effort, you know, a lot of these individuals, you know, have been running a marathon for the last 365 to 400 days. And unfortunately, there's been ongoing and repeated incidents of, you know, aggression, frustration, threatening language directed to these individuals as they continue to try to, you know, take us through this next phase of, you know, addressing this pandemic that we've been going through. And, you know, I used the analogy in the meeting the other day that, you know, it's, it's comparable to a marathon runner being almost finished the marathon and then you start criticizing the way that they run. And it's just, 
if, if there's ever an opportunity for patience and understanding, I hope that people remember that and put that in perspective when they're interacting with individuals uh, throughout the vaccination process, because, you know, we've, we've all experienced different and varied levels of stress. Um, and we all have our own circumstances, which we've had to overcome when it comes to the implications of dealing with this. But, you know, there are individuals that are further or closer to the front line than, than even, you know, us as municipal staff and, and political council. Um, and, you know, it's taken a lot of hard work for them to get there and nothing's been perfect. Um, but, you know, we're so close now and we're getting to the final straws. And I think that if we can just remember that, you know, there are other experiences than our own um, and there are stresses that, you know, are even greater than our own and, um, you know, have a bit more patience and a bit more compassion and, uh, you know, try to be as excited about it as it is without, you know, try, trying to, you know, let frustrations get the better of you now that we've come so far. So that's all I'll say on that. And I, I appreciate the, the time. And again, I just, I'll double down on thanking the firefighters for stepping up to this uh, contribution, which is going to make such a big difference for so many people. Thank you. Very good. Any uh, further comments, other members of council? Uh, no, I, go ahead, Councillor Belch. Uh, yes, through you, Mayor. Uh, apparently I've got a, uh, a doctor's appointment to, tomorrow morning. So I'll, my understanding is that uh, his office uh, has been phoning around to people that are 60 to 64 uh, to get uh, um, vaccines. So I'll let you know what comes of that tomorrow morning. Very good. And if you can make sure you follow up with uh, Yvette on that, as I know she's coordinating sure. all of those efforts, that'd be appreciated. Good. Yep. Um, just a further along that note too, and thank you, um, Deputy Mayor Graham, for that. I can uh, only imagine the amount of workload that uh, the Peterborough Health, or Peterborough Public Health, has been uh, enduring over the course of the last year. And you're right; it has been a marathon. Um, the uh, I do want to put out a special thanks to our staff on this. Um, I was elated to find when um, we when we were going moving over to red from yellow. Um, the Peterborough Examiner was doing a story specific to the protocols and they noted that uh, the township of Cap Monning was the only township in all of Peterborough County that clearly had uh, the updated protocols and procedures already in place on the website updated um, as we transitioned into that. And that doesn't just happen by accident. That's a true team effort um, from our staff that have been dedicated and committed to the cause for our residents for the, the course of the last year. And I can't uh, thank each and every one of you enough. Um, because it just speaks volume um, to the quality of the work that comes out of this uh, out of this municipal office. And that's on top of everything else that uh, our responsibilities are. So um, please, Yvette, pass along those thanks to everybody in your management meeting tomorrow and to all of the staff. It's a true team effort, and it certainly makes me very proud when I read something like that in the paper about all the efforts and how they're recognized. So thank you. So thank with you. that, I would... Uh, Ask for a motion then to provide direction for uh, staff um, in order to proceed with um, whatever is necessary in order to ensure that our um, residents are um, vaccinated. I don't think it needs to be any more any more detailed than that. Deputy Mayor Graham, second. Councillor Moore, Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Councillor Belch. Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Mayor McFadden. Yes. Councillor Moore. Yes. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Motion is approved. Thank you, everybody. Uh, item 13 corresponds for information. There is nothing, there is no corresponds for action. So we'll move right into our bylaws. Item 15.1, bylaw number 2021-15, being a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement between the Township of Cab Monaghan and Greenview Environmental Management. Be read a first, second, third time, signed by the mayor and the clerk, and the corporate seal attached thereto. Moved by. Deputy Mayor Graham, seconded by. Councillor Moore, Moore, Madam Clerk, supported vote. Councillor Huntley. Yes. Mayor McFadden. Yes. Councillor Moore. Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham. Yes. Councillor Belch. Yes. Motion is approved. Apologies, Councillor Belch, but the internet must be faster on Moore Drive than it is over in North Monaghan because Councillor Moore is beating you to the punch at 
split second ahead of your your seconds every single time. Figures, just my just luck. Call, <laughs> just call, just call me quick draw. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Councillor Moore. <laughs> Although I did notice on today's uh, Zoom meeting, uh, they've yeah. obviously updated the app again. And uh, Deputy Mayor Graham, when you speak, it indicates that you are uh, have a limited bandwidth on your connectivity. And, and Councillor Belch, you do not. So you have no excuse um, to now for uh, having bad internet because clearly it says you have good internet. Okay, there is no unfinished business. Any notices of motion? Seeing none. Confirming bylaw being bylaw number 2021-16 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the meeting held March 15th, 2021. Be read a first, second, third time. Signed by the mayor and the clerk and the corporate seal attached there too. Moved by Deputy Mayor Graham, seconded by Councillor Belch. Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Mayor I gave yes. Councillor Huntley? Yes. Councillor Belch? Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham? Yes. Councillor Moore? Yes. Motion is approved. Motion to adjourn. I have Councillor Belch and Councillor Moore. Madam Clerk, recorded vote. Councillor Moore? Yes. Councillor Belch? Yes. Councillor Huntley? Yes. Mayor McFadden? Yes. Deputy Mayor Graham? Yes. Motion is approved. And once again, Madam Clerk, thank you for that tone of voice so I can remember who's the fifth vote. On the, after the adjournment, upcoming meetings, uh, just a quick announcement with regard to the Ward Boundary Review Public Information Sessions. They will be held Wednesday, March 24th at 7 p.m. and Thursday, April 1st, 2 p.m. via Zoom. They will focus on what was heard in phase one, the strengths and weaknesses of the existing system and the preliminary Ward Boundary options for consideration. For more information and Zoom links, please visit the Township website under Ward Boundary Review. Uh, in addition, we have Millbrook Valley Trails Advisory Committee meeting 5 p.m. on March 22nd via Zoom. And we have a special council meeting at 6 o'clock p.m. via Zoom. Um, that is, um, Ms. Hurley, what, or sorry, Mr. Conley, what's the specific name of that meeting? I know it's relative to phase two. Is there a specific title to Tower Hill North? It is Tower Hill North, that's correct. Tower Hill North. It's, and again, it's, it's via Zoom, it's a public meeting. Um, and the, that link is, will be available on the township website under the special county meeting, under the calendar of events. And under, the, under that, you'll specifically see the link in order to um, participate in that Zoom meeting if you wish to be heard. Um, and then on April 1st, BIA Board of Management meeting at 8 a.m. via Zoom. Is there any other um, upcoming events or meetings that I have missed? None? All right. Thank you, everybody, for a great meeting.